Operators, break, operators break, room. Uh, break room. Um, so I think what it has been our habit, and I think we'll do it, although it'll take a minute for everybody to introduce themselves. So we'll start with this table. I'm uh, Ben Campbell. I'm representing the city of Richmond on the board and chair of the board at the moment. I'm Jim Engel. I'm representing Chesterfield County on the board. Danny Smith, representing Chesterfield County. Lincoln Saunders, representing the city of Richmond. Elder Charles, board member of Richmond. Bonnie Ashley, uh, City Attorney's Office, City of Richmond, and General Counsel to GRTC. Todd, you're representing Michael County. Tyrone Nelson, representing Michael County. Julie Tim, CEO of GRTC. Gary Armstrong, Vice Chair, representing Chester County. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Adams, Chief Operating Officer, GRTC. Tammy Smith, Executive Assistant, GRTC. Jeff Hill, Chief Operating Officer, GRTC. Tim Morrow, Chief Attorney of Operations at GRTC. Gregor Shepard, Capital Improvement Program Manager at GRTC. Avery Doherty with uh, Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Chris Warren, Richmond Dispatcher. Adrian Joyce, Chief Development Officer at GRTC. Johnson Burrell, Chief Financial Administrative Officer at GRTC. Uh, Richard Hankins, Program and Communications Manager, RGA Rapid Transit. Chris Stewart, uh, Chief Project Manager at GRTC. Rob Taggart, Director of Information Systems. Gary Dutino, Chief of Staff for NMECA. Sam Singh, Director of Planning and Scheduling, GRTC. Should be the Bill President of Richmond City Council. Diarana Moore Clark, Administrator, City of Richmond. Morgan Tony Thompson, Director of Procurement, GRTC. Good morning, Ashley Mason, Manager of Organizational Living at GRTC. Good morning, Joe Gillis, Director of Organizational Living at the Office of GRTC. Good morning, John Berry, Director of Maintenance, GRTC. Thanks, Ms. Berry, yes. Hi, Matt, make a quick safety announcement for the room. <laughs> so, for those of you who were here a few minutes ago before the shareholder meeting, we do have a quick safety announcement for everyone. Uh, as of yesterday, Tim will talk a little bit more about it. And, uh, when he gives the operation report, but the mask mandate was struck down federally. Uh, TSA also pulled it out. Um, so we are no longer enforcing a mask mandate, but we do continue to hold the CDC recommendations, which are masks are optional. You should wear your mask if you have been exposed. You should socially distance. Please continue to do all the, the things that we've been doing, the washing the hands, the taking care. When you leave this room, we ask that you do wear your mask outside this room for the protection of our operation staff. Thank you. Thank you. And so those of you who are, are new here, uh, we're really proud of the staff at GRTC and you see you see a hunk of it here in the room. These people uh, keep this thing going well and many of them will report to us during this meeting. Um, so uh, we have a couple of public comments, I think, and are you reading them? Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. This is Ashley. I'm Ashley Mason, once again, Manager of Organizational Enhancement. Welcome, everybody. Public, board public comments and intro statements. The public notice, meeting agenda, and agenda attachments for this April 19, 2022 standing meeting of the boards of GRTC, Fry Finders, and Old Dominion Transit Management Company were posted on April 14, 2022 at drivegrtc.com. Per the meeting notice, all written comments received via email by Ashley Mason prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting were provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting, are read during the public comment period of the meeting by staff, following the two-minute speaking limit and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. Also, per the meeting notes, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. This meeting, I received two submitted comments in writing. Comment number one, public comment, GRTC Board of Directors, meeting on April 19, 2022. Good morning, my name is Faith Walker. I'm a resident of Monroe County, and I'm the Executive Director of Our Day Rapid Transit. Our Day Rapid Transit is a nonprofit dedicated to educating and advocating for frequent, far-reaching public transit in our region. We first wanted to thank you all for the hard work and dedication of everyone at GRTC during the pandemic and the operator shortage. These are hard times and you have all been providing an essential service 
day in and day out. On behalf of RBA Rapid Transit, I also want to express our strong support for GRTC to continue its zero fare policy as part of the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation grant. We are strongly advocating for the city of Richmond to honor its one million pledge to grant the match. We support this continuation of zero fare for two reasons. First, it would afford critical continuing financial relief for poor bus riders who have been hit incredibly hard by the pandemic. Second, it would give our region a key opportunity to continue examining benefits, costs, and long-term prospects of zero fare policy. We appreciate your consideration on this front, and we are happy to help in whatever way we can. Grace and peace, Faith Walker, Executive Director, RBA Rapid Transit, Faith at RBA Rapid Transit. And here's our second submitted comment. Dear Glenn, Virginia Interfaith Power and Light envisions the climate crisis, eradicating environmental, so social injustices, and living in a just, thriving, and equitable world. We were an early supporter of GRTC's plans to extend and expand its zero fare initiative to 2023. Our hope was to see zero fare permanently extended. We were happy to learn that GRTC will remain zero fare through June 30, 2022, as approved by the Board of Directors. That plan is in jeopardy. If Richmond does not follow through, through on its commitment to this current budget. We are aware that fair less riders began as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic beginning March 19, 2020, for the GRTC local bus, Pulse, Bus Rapid Transit, Express Bus, and Care slash Care Transit vans. This decision has positively affected the interests of essential workers, mothers, and their children, and senior citizens who rely on public transit services to reach jobs, food, health care, and other critical community resources. The city and businesses have benefited in their efforts to reopen the economy from a fair less transit as well. As an organization that collaborates with people of faith, values, and good conscience, we acknowledge our responsibility to help support our neighbors. We also know the benefits of increasing public transit reduce carbon and other emissions from single passenger vehicles, as well as to decrease traffic congestion. Supporting the expansion of public, trans public transportation should be a priority for Richmond's current and future budgets. We have collected over 300 signatures from Richmond residents in favor of making the zero years permanently. They have signed or in a firmly language below. Sincerely, Reverend Dr. Faith Harris, co-director, Virginia Interfaith Power and Light. And here's a petition to extend zero fare for another three years. GRTC will remain zero fare through the June 30th, 2022, as approved by the Board of Directors. Since March 19, 2020, GRTC has been fareless to ride local bus, pulse, bus rapid transit, express bus, and care slash care transit vans. This decision affects the interests of essential workers, mothers and, mothers and their children, and senior citizens who rely on public transit services to reach jobs, food, health care, and other critical resources. GRTC's annual operating and capital expenditures for 2022 are expected to extend fare less lives through the fiscal year 2025. Sign below to support the fare less lives, also known as zero fare lives. And below we have 26 names listed on this petition. I submit this for the record. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone in the room who uh, wishes to speak publicly? Yes. Hello, my name is Marvin Scott, and I represent the Rodney Union members of GRPC. I'm just here to welcome the new members of the board and just ask the board that when I reach you, reach out for correspondence, can the board at least, at least answer back and show the outcomes that they can. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? All right, thank you. Um, so we have the minutes of the last meeting. And I guess uh, those who were at the meeting probably I'll give the approvals of it. Uh, Bonnie, if you can help navigate through this one. So because of the new quorum voting rules, we don't have enough people who are at the last meeting to meet that voting requirement to approve the minutes. What Julie and I have discussed is that we do have enough people to vote 
to allow the people who were here at the last meeting to approve the minutes. Right. So there would be two motions, <laughs> one to allow the members who are present to approve the minutes and then a vote for those members who were present to approve the minutes. So since she brought that up, let me just say that my intention is on votes that I don't think there's gonna be any dispute in, I'm just gonna ask for a voice vote and I'll give a chance to anybody who who objects or has a different opinion to say so. Um, so help me in this. If it seems like we have to have a, a roll call vote, we'll do it. We'll, we'll need to do that on any vote where there could be pros and cons. Because as you know, according to our new bylaws, it takes a two thirds majority of each of the three delegations to pass a, to pass any motion here. So, but uh, to facilitate things when it's pretty obvious what we're doing, um, so could I have a motion to, uh, from the board, someone on the board to allow, uh, the people who were at the last meeting to approve the minutes. So moved. Second, please. Second. second. All right, so moved and seconded that, uh, this board will permit the people who were at the last meeting to approve the minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. <laughs> All right. So could I have a motion from somebody who was at the last meeting to approve the minutes? So Second. So Thank moved. you. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. The minutes be approved. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, Do it. Yeah. Let's say aye. <laughs> All opposed? No. All right. It's passed. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have a report, a uh, series of reports beginning uh, under Adrian Torres, who is title help me with the title chief development officer, chief development officer. we have three uh, discussion items under development uh, first up is new Brendan shepherd y'all you 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 keep your keep your volume up um, up there when you're talking i am uh, my ears are not clear from <laughs> last night yeah season. yeah it's all season yeah. Yeah. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, this discussion item can be found on page 10 in your report packet. We continue to coordinate with the city of Richmond to relocate the temporary transfer plaza to the 8th and Clay lot. At this stage in the, in the project, uh, the final design has been completed. Um, IFD solicitation has closed. The IFD was posted on Richmond Times in the Richmond Times Dispatch, Free Press, Free Press, Eva website, construction bid source, and demand star. Bids were due yesterday, and we did not receive any bids. So our next step are to, is to call the contractors directly, find out why, and then from there we will update our advertisement to better suit the market. We are Preparing to trip to move our interim solution for transfer operations. May 23rd is a tentative start date for the demolition of the public safety building. We will continue to communicate this disruption to service internally and externally until project completion. If there are no questions, this includes my report. So, any questions about the uh, uh, transfer plaza um, process? You said you got no bids? No bids were received. Okay. All right, thank you very much, sir. Right, thank you. Next up is Sam Monday, April 4th, uh, the city began work to mill and pay Broad Street from 3rd 
to uh, just past Staples Mill Road, the county line. Uh, there will be milling and paving every lane on the Brown Street. And after that milling and paving work is completed, uh, which the estimate is for the end of June on that, uh, after that, um, approximately 30 days after each phase of the milling and paving work uh, is complete, they'll be able to lay down the red coating on the bus only lane. And uh, shortly thereafter, we'll be able to start using that with our pulse buses. So um, that concludes my report. Uh, are there any questions about that? And what's your job title, Sam? I'm sorry, I'm the director of planning and schedule. Thank you. Any questions on the on the bus only uh, red lanes? It's exciting. Good. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, if I could just add just briefly that this is something that the city has pursued. Um, we started this conversation um, several years ago um, after. Um, one of I think a handful of accidents that involve pedestrians not looking the other way for a bus that's essentially because of our dedicated lanes um, coming from a, a space that was either unexpected or just the, the awareness wasn't there. Um, hoping that the red lanes will help certainly you know advise that caution for anybody who's crossing you know not in a traditional crosswalk or uh, in a safe manner. So hoping that this will be a positive step for safe, pedestrian safety in the city. Thank you. This is a grant. Have we got a grant on this? No, this is after the city of Richmond. Um, is, is their initiative, and we are we are very pleased with this moving forward. Not only will it help for the overall safety for the pedestrian environment, also for the vehicular. We also have many people who are new to Richmond, or even people who aren't, who haven't driven in that area, sometimes can be confused by what lanes they should be or not be in. Yeah. Having that physical reminder should really elevate everyone's awareness about the dedicated lanes. And there's national data on this, right? Yes, this yeah. is red is the national standard for this. Yeah. And, I, and I could be wrong, but I think the city of Richmond did receive perhaps a DRPT grant to support this. I hope we really double check, but I believe that's correct. Yeah, for, for Thank you. Good. All right. Morning. I'm Amy Adores, Chief Development Officer. I'm going to give you guys a brief update on where we are with purchasing daily vehicles for your T stations. Um, a little bit of background. In 2019, we saw great success with Pulse ridership. Uh, our goal was 3,500 per day when we actually applied for the grant. Uh, and once we started, we exceeded that immediately. Um, starting with the first week, we were at 5,200. Um, by the end of FY19, we were close to 7,000 riders per week. I'm uh, sorry, per weekday. Uh, this continued in FY20. We had some days that were 8,000 per day. At this point in time, we're about 5,300 per weekday. So our numbers are continuing to increase. Still, we stayed above the 3,500 um, that we had planned to reach in the beginning. So with that, we had challenges related to ridership success. Um, we had 41 vehicles. Uh, with that, we had capacity concerns. Uh, we had increased platform loads, longer dwell times, uh, frequency and runtime reliability um, was a problem, and then passing passengers as drop-off only. Um, operators would switch drop-off only, knowing they couldn't fit anyone else on the bus. All right, so with that, we began to talk about an option um, to address the issue. One was the possibility of increasing frequency on the pulse. Um, with that, that required more vehicles, more operators, and more operating dollars to go with that, and that to be sustainable, was not a one time cost. And then the additional bus storage required for the facility itself if we got more 40 foot vehicles. Another option was to purchase articulated vehicles. Um, these are the 60 foot vehicles. Um, that have the accordion style in the middle. Uh, this would be a capital investment for GRTC. Uh, we can research grant opportunities. We would still need additional bus storage for the facility uh, and we have to modify the stations. So with that, we decided to move forward with the capital investment of articulated vehicles. Uh, we applied for a DRPT grant uh, for three vehicles. Uh, we also applied for a grant for the station modifications. Both of those were awarded. 
Uh, we also sought funds through SmartScale for three additional uh, articulated vehicles. We also were awarded those. Uh, we have just completed the feasibility study for the station modifications. So our next steps um, for this are to do analysis of our facility and determine where we can actually store these vehicles once they arrive, uh, expand um, the facility itself. Uh, we're going to do engineering construction with the recommended modifications. The estimate came in for construction around $700,000. So that's a change to every single station. Um, they are minimal. Uh, they have knee walls out there today, which basically keeps you in the area for pedestrians. Those would be removed because there are now three doors opposed to two doors. I'm going to allow access as well as uh, small changes to allow for ADA entry. And then we need to procure those six vehicles. Uh, the smart scale grant is not awarded until FY24, which is right around the corner. Um, that is where we are today. Any questions? Adrian, do you need to extend the deck area for the stops or is it just the platforms modifying. themselves are good. It's just the brick knee walls that are about three and a half yeah. inches tall. Those yeah. are in the way the doors, those will have to be removed. Okay. And then as far as like the texture tile, those will have to be added. And then where the, the rug rail will also have to be extended. Okay. Sure. So the relevancy of this to this board, one is to make sure that uh, existing board members are updated where we are, new board members to give you an update that we are moving forward on this, but knowing that the construction market is very tight, we need to spread the word so that when this does go out, that we put the IFB out for the construction, that we do come back with bids. Um, and we do ask that all of our partners, especially Richmond, Chesterfield, and in Rico, assist us in locating and maybe um, finding uh, partners that might bid on these projects so that we can get them done. If we don't want to buy 40, 60 foot buses and then not be able to use them because we can't modify our stations. We did have one here, what, a couple of years ago that we all, that we got to ride um, back and forth on Broad Street. Yeah, the use of the 60 foot buses will be an operational savings overall. Um, and it will also help. We have overloading of our 40 foot buses. If we are not able to make the modification and we want to put more 40 foot buses out, um, the frequency will have to increase and our operation costs will have to increase. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doris. All right, so what's next here? Um, operations maintenance report. Cheryl Adam, Tom. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. We will begin the operations and maintenance report with Mr. Tim Bowen, covering the operating statistics for the month of March. Good morning, Mr. Chair, good morning, members of the board, and everyone else. Uh, my name is Tim Barr, I'm the Chief of Transit Operations for GRTC. Uh, my job, for those of you who are new to the board, is I have the oversight of the service delivery for the fixed route and paratransit divisions. Uh, as you know, our fixed route service, uh, which is operated by GRTC, and our paratransit division, which currently is operated by First Transit, we contract that service out. Uh, so if you look on page 19 of the board package, uh, what you will see is uh, just a little breakdown of some of the metrics that we use, the key performance indicators that we track the service on a monthly basis. Uh, some of the things like on time performance, uh, absenteeism rate, uh, and so forth. Uh, you'll see some positive trends, but you'll also see some trends that we need to uh, improve on and, and to work on, particularly our on time performance. You know, we're about 68% as far as on time performance goes on the fixed route side, uh, which is not where we should be. Uh, we know we have some challenges with construction work, work road work in areas. Just heard about Broad Street, for example. Uh, so we, we try to navigate around those as best we can, so we can maintain good on-time performance for our customers. Uh, paratransit, uh, there's some work that needs to be done there, and on-time performance is tied somewhat into traffic and, and road conditions, but a lot of it has to do with available operators. Uh, so we continue to work with our uh, partner with First Transit, and their recruiting efforts to step up to make sure that they have enough operators uh, to manage the service accordingly. Uh, absentee is a rate on the fixed route side has improved somewhat, uh, mainly because of the drop we've had in, in positive COVID cases, uh, some folks coming back from long term uh, absences, and so forth. So we do see some positive trends in that area. Uh, I want to spend 
the rest of my time talking about staff. You know, every month I, I like to give an overview on where we are uh, from a personnel standpoint or as far as operators go. Uh, this past month, uh, we are currently at 242 full-time operators and 23 part-time operators. Our target number is somewhere roughly around 300 on the full-time side. So you see we still have some work to do. Uh, we have classes that we uh, have started basically every month. Uh, we started late last year, uh, December. We have a class that is just finishing up the January group. Uh, we have a class in February that will be graduating over the next few weeks. Uh, and those basically have like six, seven, eight people per class. Uh, we had some double-digit classes before the pandemic. Uh, so we've seen some positive trends from our uh, advertisements, recruiting efforts to improve upon that. Uh, we've had a class, we had a class starting in February and also March, uh, roughly about the same number of uh, new operators. Uh, we don't have a class starting this month. That's the bad news, but we want to try to have at least one class every month. But we do have two classes starting in May. Uh, we have a class roughly about seven people that will start on May the 2nd. Uh, and we're currently doing interviews for our May 16th class. So we look to have you know, hopefully a, at least seven, maybe even more than that uh, for that class. Uh, and as I'll explain in a minute, the reason why we're continuing with those efforts. Uh, as Adrian mentioned earlier, uh, and Sam uh, mentioned as well, uh, we want to make sure we have enough operators to manage the service properly, especially as we hope to grow uh, the service as well. Uh, it has some challenges, though, when it comes to the retention. Uh, we average roughly losing about three to four operators a month due to various reasons, you know, terminations, resignations, and so forth. Uh, this past month was a challenge. You know, we actually lost 11 people this past month. Uh, several of those were resignations. Uh, we don't know if it's part of the great resignation trend that you've heard about across the country. Uh, but whatever the case may be, uh, we know that we have to look at what we're doing and, and do things a little differently uh, to try to retain people. Uh, you know, we've done some things in the past, uh, but we want to look at some things that we can uh, hopefully cut short up and, and get that number back down to a more manageable number. Uh, some of the things as far as the quality of life. Ask questions. Oh. Okay, keep going. Uh, I've got some questions, but you go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, as far as the quality of life goes, you know, uh, our operators, in fact, uh, if you pass on your way into the uh, room here, your operators currently are going through their run uh, bid process, the booking, uh, this week. So they pick on their runs uh, that they'll be operating for a period of about three or four months. Uh, so we, we work with the union, you know, work with the confines of the contract to see what we can do to make sure that we are managing that process to improve the quality of life. We want to continue to do that uh, so that we'll improve in that area uh, from that standpoint. You know, also, uh, you know, ways in which we can uh, communicate and talk with our operators on a regular basis. Julie does Snapchats. I hope I said Snap. Chats <laughs> in which we have snacks and, and so forth, and so round table forum discussion. Uh, uh, she started those uh, a few months back and continue those as well uh, for operators and employees in general uh, across the company uh, to talk carefully about different issues and concerns. Uh, that feedback comes back to uh, the different directors and staff members and so forth, look at ways in which we can improve in that area, improve in whatever areas and so forth. Uh, forums that we started, like our Facebook page. Uh, where we can try to get uh, employees, operators to talk about different issues that are going out there in the service area. Uh, also, uh, you know, safety meetings. You know, we had a safety meeting last night, a very vibrant group, uh, uh, talked about various safety issues, but also some other things that come up as well. Uh, in the last few meetings, we've actually had uh, a liaison, community liaison from uh, RPD, uh, to come in and talk about different things from that perspective. Because we've seen you know, some of the challenges across the country and here at GRTC uh, about, you know, whether it's uh, driver assaults or other things that are going on in the buses and so forth. So we want to make sure that our employees in general feel safe and our customers feel safe in riding service as ridership continues to grow uh, and hopefully as we grow employees within our company as well. Uh, because we want to make sure that we involve, inform, and engage with our company, with our employees, and the public. You know, inform people, keep people in the know of what's going on throughout, uh, you know, whether it's public comments, whether it's other types of forums and so forth. Uh, you know, involve people, you know, get feedback from folks in, in different ways in that area as well. And engage them to make sure that you're getting positive feedback. So we want to reinstitute our care advisory committee and our transit advisory group 
hopefully sometime this year as well. Those put on high edge because of the pandemic. Uh, but we want to make sure the rest of the is to get uh, engagement with the public to make sure that we know from them what are those issues and concerns and, and that we are expressing it and dealing with those as well. Real quick, because I know that Judy likes to keep us at five minutes, and I know I'm way beyond that, my apologies, but I want to make sure that you know you all know from me, uh, especially the new members of the board, you know, what's going on and what are some of those challenges, what are some of the good things that we're doing as well. You know, we started a pilot program, uh, Uber. Uh, back in December, and we uh, wanted to make sure that we offset uh, those that service uh, adjustments that we made back in December, uh, especially on the late night, early morning trips. And we started out in January with about five trips that uh, that service did. In February, it was 31 trips. In this past month, it was 49 trips uh, that operated. So you can see that that service is steadily growing. Um, so we're going to reevaluate that. We probably will extend it uh, past the six month holiday, but we'll reassess that as we continue going in the months uh, uh, coming ahead. Uh, lastly, I mentioned, uh, Julie mentioned it earlier. Uh, for those of you who may not have heard in the very beginning, you know, the mask mandate originally was supposed to be extended to May 3rd, uh, but because of the uh, order that came through from the federal judge in Florida, uh, that mask mandate you know, has been lifted. However, uh, we are encouraging people to still, uh, if you feel comfortable wearing a mask, continue to do so, social distance, and so forth. Uh, so we will see some subtle changes uh, as we go out uh, today and beyond when it comes to uh, mask mandates now being optional as opposed to being mandated, mandatory. So uh, I know there's some questions, uh, and if not, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Brother Nelson. All righty. Uh, <coughs> How you pronounce your last name? Barn. Barn. Okay. Yes. So, uh, 242 full timers, 300 full timers as a goal. We lost 11 full timers this month. Do you, do you do exit interviews? Yes. Yes. We, we talk to our operators and employees in general to see why they're leaving. And, and some of it is what I mentioned earlier. You know, you know quality of life. You know. We wanted to make sure that you know that some of those things that we challenge ourselves with is well to work with them. Uh, so I think that's one of the bigger challenges we have to work with. And, and to be honest with you, uh, people have choices. You know, a few years ago before the pandemic, you know, you may not have as much choices out there as you did before. Uh, but if people have a sense of I can go somewhere else uh, where I may want to stay, you know, some people take that option. Uh, and we find that it's not always uh, economics uh, that may force people to go other places. You know, we have a decent wage, a certain wage, and then top pay, uh, benefits, and so forth. We still offer pension to our employees, but but some of the things like you know quality, like that's why I mentioned earlier about you know the run bids. I think that's one of the uh, concerns that I think some of our employees are challenged with, especially if they uh, have child care concerns and things of that nature. Okay, so. And I, I got a couple of questions, so just uh, all of that don't require long answers, I don't think. Just I'm just learning, so it's much more important. So we were at 253 full timers, and now we're down to 242. Or were we at 242, and now we're down to 231? Well, we've been kind of treading water. We've been in that 240 range, uh, a little over 250 for a while. Uh, before the pandemic, we were up around 270. Uh, in fact, we had top 280. Uh, at one point in 2020, I think that late fall. Uh, but that decline has steadily come, come about, right. and, and we've been challenged to try to maintain but it. Back up. Yes. You, you said 242 full times. So I guess what I'm saying is, did you start the month at 253? And now, no, 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 no. It, it's been like last month, I believe it was around 240, uh, around that same number, roughly. So uh, it may be a little less than that. But, uh, but it's been in that 240 range over the last few months. If okay. I may jump in, we have classes every month. So as we, our classes tend to be somewhere around that five to 10 to 15 range. Over the past several months, we've been managing about status quo between what we've been adding and losing. Okay. Before right. the advertising program and the launch that we did in December, we were losing, we weren't gaining. Now we're right. status quo and we're hoping to reverse that trend even further. All right, so that, that was my point. Where are we, um, so part-timers, you said we have 23 part-timers. What's the, what's the, um, What's the expectation? We want to be at what? Well, our contractual requirement is no more than twelve percent of our workforce can be part time. So, so we have a little wiggle room to maybe add another uh, six or so, roughly around thirty. Okay, so the, the hope would be thirty part timers. Mm, roughly, but like I said, that is part of our labor agreement. 
uh, that that number can vary because the labor agreement says we can go no more than twelve percent of whatever our full time uh, workforce is. All right. And the, um, Julie already answered the question about how long the class. So you run a class every single month. We've been trying to do two a month, but yes, in the past we would run several a year. We've accelerated that over the uh, since December to try and get towards two a month. We've certainly been doing at least one a month, sometimes two a month. April uh, was a, a, sh a short month for us, I guess, as far as the classes, so maybe we'll have two. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the classes, like two weeks? No, no, no. no, no. no. Eight, eight weeks. Eight weeks. It, uh, actually, it actually has been, yeah, yeah. It has been extended because uh, prior was up to a few months ago, uh, you had to come in with at least a CDL MERS. Uh, so we actually changed that criteria so that people could come in with, even without a CDL MERS permit. Okay. Uh, because we provide that training uh, on site uh, to take the test as well as for the CDL test itself. So that extended the classes. So if I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so just very quickly, and that was one of our operators, he's um, actually pretty amazing on the street. We, I've had a pleasure talking with him on a couple of occasions about what we're doing. But so just a little bit of background. When we started COVID, uh, before that started, we had about that 270, 280. We only had a few missing positions. Over the course of COVID, when we weren't able to recruit, and I think that's universal across the industry and across the region, but we continued to lose one, two, three operators a month some through natural retirement, some because they need to stay home for COVID, and some through uh, other other reasons, the employment reasons. When you're losing two or three a month, that's actually a pretty standard number, and it's okay, but when you're not recruiting two or three or four a month over the course of two years, that results in a loss of close to 50 people. So when we got to last September, we raised the red flag and said we can't continue to have this slow loss, we have to turn it around, which is where we started to aggressively recruit, aggressively campaign, and we have turned it around to more of a status quo. We expected to lose a lot more people in January than we did lose. January tends to be a time when many of our senior operators retire. Um, that was put off. We believe that from our exit interviews, many of the ones we lost in April were part of that, maybe potentially a deferred retirement before the next run did. We had some terminations for other reasons as well, but we are more in that status quo period now, and we're pushing to make that uh, reversal trend, which is why Tim is talking about all the other methods. One of the reasons we were having trouble getting people in last year, the year before, is DMV it was very hard to get an appointment. And so anyone before had to have their DMV or their CDL permit to start work for us. Staff, training, operations, they work with DMV, and now we can actually hire people without the permit. We can train them here, test them here, and get them their permit and their license, but that means the training period is longer, and sometimes people don't make it through. So we might have longer, larger class sizes, but we also might lose more people who can't make it through that training period. So those are some of the things we've been doing to reverse that trend. Okay, uh, two more questions, and again, First meeting, so I mean, we're, it's a whole lot that we're learning. So, yes, sir. Um, the uh, I won't get into the pay because I think that's going to take us down a whole another um, rabbit hole. We're spending based upon the um, what do you call that? What, what do we have? A, uh, what do we have a couple of weeks ago when we talked? What, what do we call that? Our, um, orientation. orientation. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm at our orientation, we talked about advertising and the spending for advertising yes what is that again and is it um so do you think that the amount of money we spend we're spending for advertising is helping keep us afloat um and what's the plan i guess and maybe this will be a part of our discussion what's the plan to get us to pre-pandemic um, number so that we can return and restore some of these routes. So, so um, we did unfortunately lose Carrie Rose Pace uh, to Dominion Power. I can never forgive them for taking her away, but she was a dream job for her. And unfortunately, you can't ask people to stay when they had their dream job handed to them. What she was presenting before she left was uh, analysis and data that showed that every time we put out advertisements the, the, on the CBS, NBC, Fox, we put out in social media, we had large spikes in um, interest, large spikes in applications, 
and we had more credible applicants come through, it increased. We used our CARES Act money through a motion at the board to extend and to increase the amount of that external advertising. That is part of what reversed the trend. We have uh, HR currently is, tends to be a little swamped with the number of applicants we get to be able to filter through to get to the ones that are, um, are not credible. What's the word I'm looking for? Eligible. eligible. That's the word I want, eligible. To eligible applicants to get through the process. Uh, but that advertising has made a significant difference in getting people in the door and allowing us to increase our class numbers and class sizes to get those eligible applicants in. We've also done hiring bonuses for new hires to be able to help bridge the pay gap between a new starting operator pay and the base pay they eventually get to after two to three years. So that has helped get people in the door as well. Part of the challenge we have with uh, recruitment is, you said the, the CDL, we've overcome that. Um, getting the applicants in, we've started to overcome that through the advertising. Um, having more classes, that has helped us to overcome. Having more conversations with people when they get in the door to help retain them and to mentor them as they come onto the books. Uh, doing our classes uh, in the past, the training classes tended to be more of a nine to five training. We've also changed the training classes so that the classes are more in the nighttime and the weekend so that when they leave training, it's more like what they will feel when they start working. So we did have people that would come in, they would go through eight weeks, 12 weeks of nine to five classes and then have to work nights and weekends. Like, oh, well, this is what I signed up for. Giving them more of the experience of a new operator through training has also helped us to retain a little bit more or people drop out earlier. So we have a lot of those programs in place to help increase that. Now, what is our plan beyond that? We continue to look for ways to retain our operators in that five year to 13 year match. That is probably our biggest flight risk, um, our second biggest flight risk. So our three flight risks, right? that's not really the right term, the, our, our risks for losing people is right after training when they realize that being an operator is truly a challenging uh, position. So that five to 13 time range when they realize that the amount of time it takes to get to seniority means that they're going to be running maybe some of the less desirable shifts for a lot longer than they had hoped. And then of course, at retirement age when people are just ready to retire. Those are the three areas where we lose. I think we've gotten uh, over some of the issues with the recruitment. The issues with people retiring um, we're, we've asked people to stay a little bit longer. There's a bonus coming up in June that hopefully will keep people a, a little bit longer to bridge that gap. But when people are ready to retire, they're going to retire. Some will come back part time. That five to 13 year range, we continue to have issues. Uh, there is, we need to have service on the nights. We need to have service on the weekends. And as we grow and we put more nighttime service out and more weekend service out, more of our operators have to work nights and weekends. That means it's gonna take longer and longer for people to rise into seniority and get what they consider to be those preferable routes that don't have nights and weekends. We can't have all of our service nine to five. And so helping our operators get through that period is part of our biggest challenge of retention in that time frame. I know it was a long answer, but I hope that a little bit of it, where it, we see our risks. It was a long answer. So is there, <laughs> is there, is there a short answer to the so the trend, if the if 300 full timers, if that's the target, and it seems like pre-pandemic, through pandemic, through where we are now, seems like we are going down. So 300 is the target. I heard you mention 270, 280, now we're at 240. We're spending a whole lot of money to stay um, in that range or keep it from falling below. I guess for me. I don't see how we get to it right now. Right now, the focus is on maintaining, not on recouping. Uh, I mean, and, and, and it may not be a short answer to that. I, no. I'm just trying to think about how, when we look about ad routes, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, we're just trying to stay above water right now and not, um, yes. it, it doesn't really seem like the target is on. Um, getting back to pre-pandemic numbers. 
So uh, I apologize if that was the impression that I gave. Our, tar our goal is absolutely to grow back to a pre-pandemic. Our goal is to grow beyond that for expansion. We have the, the promise of CBTA to expand. That is absolutely our target. Uh, this is a local, regional, national issue of recruitment and retention, not just in transit, but across all the transportation and outside transportation industry. We are not alone in this. I've been talking with um, transit agencies and transit CEOs across the country to look for what solutions they have for this exact same problem. We are not in this boat alone. We are looking for every solution to grow and put our staff back on the streets. But unfortunately, this is a national issue. And the fact that we've been able to turn it around from a gradual loss to a sustain is a win. Now we need to get sustained to grow as our next win. We were actually lower than we are right now, right? Uh, we did get a little bit lower. We were maybe down into the, I don't know if we got to 239. Yes, 238. 238 was our low. So we have turned it around. But unfortunately, we, the growth that we had in January, February, and March, um, April did take us a little bit of a hit. April was a little bit of a hit. Uh, obviously, this is going to be with us, um, Eldridge. Yeah, um, I'm not sure how is uh, First Transit doing as far as recruiting and uh, keeping operators? Okay. Yes, and with First Transit, uh, they sure. have done some, um, some things as well, uh, you know, virtual uh, concepts as far as getting folks in. Uh, their last couple of classes, I think they had like seven or eight as well. Um, and this class, they had a class starting yesterday, uh, only a couple, uh, but they're doing their classes about every three weeks or so. And that's how long it takes for their training is three weeks. So as soon as one class starts, another one uh, stops, another one starts right after that. So they've done a little better, uh, but they have a similar trend as we have over the last uh, couple of years. But uh, we've seen some, some turnaround with them in the last few months, last couple of months or so. And the second question I have is that uh, how are we doing as far as maintenance, mechanics, and stuff? We need to keep the bus running and all the gas on my track. As you used to say, and, and I carry that over, the people who turn the wheels and turn the wrenches on the back of, the, of this organization. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Bird can give you a little update in a minute, uh, but we've had some positive uh, uh, with, with them as well. Uh, as, as you asked, uh, Reverend Nelson, at June 22, as far as the uh, adversities go, that also included our mechanics, uh, the time bonuses and things of that nature. We've seen some some more mechanics on the floor. I go down there every day, walk through, uh, and, and we've seen a few more folks. Uh, so when I hear, you know, the tools going, that tells me we're doing okay. Uh, Tony can give you some of the exact numbers uh, here in a minute. But yeah, we've seen some positive uh, on the maintenance side as well. So, uh, uh, if you if, uh, if you want to check on page 19 where it says scheduled trips operated, um, that'll give you a sense of how low it got for us in terms of, of availability. So, um, you know, that's clearly improved and, sh and that actually shows some of what we've been able to do. But um, Reverend Nelson, you're right in nailing what is really one of the continuing and most important things we're dealing with. Thank you, Ms. Mark. Next step, Sam Sink will return to give you the ridership report for the month of March, as well as a recording of the form of the long road out. Um, this is the ridership report for March of 2022. Um, local fixed route ridership was at a little over 545,000 for the month. Please keep up. Yes, it's hard. To, back here, it's a bit difficult to get. Yeah. Uh, local fixed route ridership was a little over 545,000 for the month of March. That represents a 15% increase over February. Um, and looking back to pre-pandemic ridership levels, that represents a 2.17% increase. So uh, we are continuing to kind of recover from COVID uh, on our local fixed route ridership. ridership. Uh, for the poll 
Holster at 127,636 mortgages. Um, based looking at the, how that compares to February, that's an increase of 8.3%. Uh, and then looking at our how it compares to pre pandemic levels, uh, we're still down about 27% on the pulse ridership. Uh, but we are improving month over month, you know, we're showing growth, and that's encouraging. Looking at the express route ridership, uh, we are at a little over 6,300 for the month. Um, if we look month over month, that's a 31% increase. Uh, so, you know, we went back and kind of looked at that. Uh, wanted to make sure that it's not so much that we're experiencing standing room only on those express routes. As you know, that's closed door service. Uh, you know, it might be standing for a long time because we get standing room only there. And so far, we do have the additional capacity. Uh, you know, if you look back to our pre COVID numbers on the express routes, we're still down about 75%. So there is a lot of room for growth and to accommodate increasing ridership as people feel more comfortable coming back to the express routes. Uh, you know, as, as COVID recedes and becomes endemic. Uh, looking at the care services, care was at 18,609 for March, care plus was at 4,498, and the care on demand service was at 3,981. So for a total uh, care transit ridership of 27,088, uh, that does represent a nearly 12% increase month over month and is up slightly from pre-COVID ridership levels uh, by about 1.4%. Uh, looking at uh, Vanpool, the ride finder service, uh, ridership year to date on that through February, uh, Vanpool stop service uh, ridership does run a month behind in our reporting. So this is year to date from February, uh, it was just under 75,000. Uh, if we look year over year, um, back in FY21, the year to date ridership was at 77,000, so you know, it's roughly a 3.8% decrease. And looking at pre pandemic, uh, the van pool ridership is down about 71%. So. And that concludes my monthly ridership report. If there were any questions on that, all right. Oh, Tom. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. On the uh, some of the routes that were uh, cut short off as far as time is concerned on the street, I know that. You had a service that would that the customers could call in and get a ride. How many is doing that? What's the number of rides? Yeah, it was the uh, Uber service. I defer to Tim. Forty-nine for the month of March, Mr. Coles. Forty-nine. Yes, sir. We're not sure. So, those of you who are not on the board, what happened is so we cut the early hour and the late hour on several of our routes where we were short on drivers and uh, promised people that if they got stuck and they were uh, needed to uh, support, we would support them. And that's what that, uh, that Uber thing is. As a, just as a little bit more information, we use Uber as shorthand the same way we talk about Phoenix as shorthand. Um, it really is an on-demand service. People have a choice between using a, a GRTC driver uh, one of our supervisors, and we have Uber on contract, and we also have who is it? Ralph? User, 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 user yeah. as different options. So passengers do have an option about which service they use. When they do choose the Uber contract, it costs about ten to fifteen dollars. So we're really talking about four hundred, five hundred dollars a month. This is costing us to date. Um, so it's very reasonable cost to provide that last mile. We do hope that as we increase our operators, we will be putting that service back as soon as we can. Uh, but it gives us an idea about the demand for that type of service at that hour. Thank you. Todd, did you have something? Two questions. Uh, first off, does the van pool numbers count towards the system wide ridership? Um, I'll have to go back and look. I don't think it does because it's a month behind, but I will. Uh, second question, I'm aware that Henrico curtailed operation on three of our four express routes. Uh, what does that look like in the other jurisdictions? Are you asking uh, what other... What other express routes, routes have been um, suspended due to COVID? Just, yeah, just the Henrico ones. Just Henrico. Just across the highway to and the city's 64. Sorry, Peter's President Yes. And Ranco was the, the one jurisdiction that had the majority of those express routes. 
Um, we did cut back some of the service levels and hours during COVID, but um, Winchester has just the one, and Richmond has the one, and Petersburg has the one, and Richmond and Peter, uh, and Rhine has several, and we consolidate this. And I think that there will be some discussion around that in the quarterly performance of those routes. Thank you. And what's the, uh, I mean, what, what other point are you saying that we had most of the routes? I mean, are you saying that it costs GRTC more? Are we not paying for them? No, no. So you guys had five routes for right. direct county express routes, 23, 26, 27, 28, 29. I apologize. So part of what we did when we looked at uh, the past year, in the past two years about ridership, and we looked at where the ridership was high and where the ridership was low. As a board, we had to consider where those resources went. Um, what you see here is that the ridership on the express service, which predominantly is in Enrico, dropped down to about 95%. So running those buses at, at some times cost us as much as $100 a trip. It made sense to consolidate those to be able to continue to provide service to Enrico citizens and still have one in Enrico, one in Chesterfield, one in Petersburg, one in Richmond, and to divert those resources to where ridership still can be very high and buses can so I apologize if I gave a, a, a misperception or a mischaracterization, but it was an allowance of being able to consolidate, provide that service, and make sure that the service was effective and efficient. And when we get the quarterly report, which will go down, break down route by route, you'll see some of those metrics. So we're all learning uh, what will end up in terms of virtual uh, work long term, uh, which may affect that, that's, that's what hit us during COVID, and uh, we don't know. And um, just, yeah. uh, the shifts, every shift that we make, I know this is, uh, we have a new board here. So whenever we make any service change to any of our routes, it is coordinated with the jurisdiction being impacted before it takes effect. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Can I move on to the quarterly reports? Well, our quarterly report breaks down uh, our different routes by kind of the characterization of the type of route that it is, uh, and kind of give some metrics and compare and contrast uh, how they're doing year over year. Um, so we'll start with uh, BRT. You know, this category, a uh, category of different categories, uh, operates high frequencies, uh, and they really high capacities. Uh, the termini, termini are generally major activity centers, and there's also stop at major, stops at major activity centers and the destinations. Of course, we currently have one BRT route, the Pulse, uh, serves Richmond and Enrico uh, for rockets landing up the Willow Lawn. Uh, if you look at the ridership in the third quarter, you know, we're at 356,000 on that. Uh, kind of more importantly, moving over to some of these metrics, uh, if you look at our total cost per passenger of $2.80, uh, that is trending downward year over year, which is encouraging. Uh, that's probably because our ridership is trending up. Uh, we also see that the uh, average max load at peak, uh, what we do to calculate that, we look at the uh, average load or the average maximum load for uh, weekdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, and then whichever of those three math metrics is highest, uh, that's the average that we use. So we're kind of getting a sense of how full the bus generally is at its busier, busiest or busier times. Uh, and if we look at the quarter three data on that, you know, we're at 28 uh, for our average peak load uh, year over year, that's up 54%. So again, you know, that fits our trend of the ridership coming back to the pulse. Uh, and uh, our next category of routes are arterials. Uh, these travel at least 50% of their route on a major arterial corridor, uh, major thoroughfare. Their termini are generally major activity centers, uh, you know, in Broad Street or the education highway or routes. And if we look at the metrics, uh, we'll be on page 30 for those of you following along. Uh, from our top performers, uh, you see the, the various iterations of the one. Uh, you know, that traveled along Chamberlain and down Pulse Street. 
uh, connecting downtown to sort of north and south. Uh, I know that's one of our all stars here. You see passenger per trip uh, in the 30s for most of those. Uh, we have average peak loads you know, in the high teens and 20s. Uh, so those are doing very well. Uh, we'll also draw your attention to the five, uh, which kind of connects uh, you know, Cary area to downtown and then out to some of the ports. Um, you know, that's we're, we're looking at a total of 120,000 uh, ridership for that for quarter three. You'll see that's only behind uh, Route 1A, so it's very high ridership. That was one of the routes that we wanted to uh, bring frequency back to uh, in the main board, but unfortunately, due to the uh, you know, operator recruiting issues that we're having, uh, we weren't quite able to do that, but it remains a priority uh, in the September booking. Uh, looking at where there's room for improvement, uh, I'll first kind of draw your attention. You see uh, down below the chart, there's a kind of pass wash underperforming. Uh, what we do when we get into these categories that do have multiple routes in the category, uh, which is everything with ERT, we kind of compare them all to each other and sort of see uh, you know, what's the cream that's rising to the top in that category uh, and which ones you know are kind of near the bottom. Are there ways that we can tweak them and improve them or, you know, do we need to maybe rethink something about the route? Um, you know, we're, we'll get into uh, some some lower performing routes later on where we'll discuss uh, what some of those options might look like. But uh, here in the arterials, uh, you'll see the 3C. Uh, you'll notice the total cost per passenger is highlighted in red there as underperforming relative to its peers at $11.25 per trip. Uh, you know, it's worth noting that. That route uh, only runs evenings and weekends. Um, so it acts more as a lifeline route. It's not going to, it doesn't even have service during those peak ridership times. So uh, it's kind of expected to not do as well as some of these peer routes. Uh, looking at the 14, you'll notice highlighted in red, uh, it's got nine passengers per trip, kind of underperforming relative to its peers here. Uh, it's worth noting that the 14. Share has a lot of overlap with other routes. Um, so a lot of time the riders that are you know waiting for that bus, they might hop on a different one that happens to come by because there are, are several options along those different lines. Our next category is the community radial routes. Uh, these routes generally go through neighborhoods uh, and serve those near to connect those neighborhoods uh, to main corridors to bigger thoroughfares. We look at their performance metrics. Uh, the 12 and 20 are some of our better performers here, uh, serving Churchill and uh, that 20 orbital, you know, connecting south side, uh, running right here past the RTC and uh, you know, across the river. Uh, you see passengers per trip, you know, 11, 15. Uh, it's doing, you know, better than its peers uh, with average peak lows of 10 and 14. Um, you know, if we look at some uh, that maybe were labeled as uh, underperforming relative to their peers, uh, you see the 76 on Patterson, uh, the 77 for Grove route. Uh, it's worth noting that one was realigned, the 77 was. Uh, so you'll see kind of a reduction in uh, service miles year over year, um, and then an, an increase of you know 88 uh, percent in passengers per trip. Um, you know costs per passenger are down, so that one's being a little more efficient with the uh, service reduction, providing uh, higher passenger per trip numbers, lower cost per passenger numbers. Um, it's worth noting uh, some of these passenger per trips levels and cost per trip level uh, may justify on demand service of smaller vehicles, and that's something that we're going to be looking at as part of the update to our fleet plan. Uh, our next category are the circulator feeder connector routes. Uh, routes in this category connect outlying sections of the service area to one another. They generally have stop at an activity center at their termina, and uh, they allow for connection to arterial or core arterial routes. So if you look at the metrics in this category, uh, you'll see the, the 4A and 4B have uh, some improvements in their passengers per trip uh, and some reductions in the cost of passengers that are notable. Uh, we did have some frequency reductions on those routes, 
improve the productivity. Um, you'll see the 88, which is uh, called out as being kind of underperforming relative to its peers there at the $26.61 uh, cost per passenger. Um, we do have some frequency reductions slated for that route in the May board that should improve productivity. That's a route that uh, serves Altria uh, down here on the south side. Um, and then the 93, the Azalea connector, uh, that was also kind of called out as uh, you know, being not quite as productive as it appears at $20.54 per passenger. Um, this might be a good candidate for microtransit. That's something that we are actively looking at uh, you know, as we kind of begin the wrap up for any phase of the microtransit study. We've got the data in, you know, looking at where we want the implementation of those higher zones to be. Uh, this might be a good candidate for that. Quick question. Quick. Sure. The route names. Um, so 4A, well, let, let's do 4B. The only Darby Town I know is in Michael. So there's a Darby Town in Richmond. Yes, I believe that 4A and 4B are these ones that are uh, kind of down at the bottom, the east end. Um, those are the full three. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. 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 Yeah. So, why, I'm, again, I'm just curious. Why name it Darby Town if only a little bit of it? I mean, um, where, do, where the route names come from? Where I guess often route names are destinations of the route. Uh, you know, some are legacy names, or we just don't think it's the best name for the route, the most descriptive of where it goes. Especially when you get into these routes that kind of cut in and out of neighborhoods, it can be difficult to assign it a street name like Broad Street. Um, so. That, that can be part of it, but Adrian, did you have a comment on that one specifically? I mean, pretty much it. It's either the major corridor that it travels on, or maybe as the major destination area at the end. We try to stray away from things like street names because those may change, um, or stray away from like an exact business. So it'd be the main corridor or where it is. So, so 4B is pretty much a Richmond route that just the very end swings of the end into Darlington Road. 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 Yeah. And needs a place to kind of turn around and go to Richmond Thank you. And you also often see these uh, route swingers from A, B, or C in our system. Uh, they're kind of part of their name is meant to differentiate it from the rest of the route because they, they serve the same alignment for much of the route, but then they kind of branch closer to the termini. Uh, so you have <coughs> riders to be able to differentiate uh, so where they're going towards the end. Moving on to our last category, express notes. Uh, as I alluded to before, uh, these routes generally you know, start from an origin point at a park and ride uh, or similar kind of area and provide closed door express service to a uh, downtown or a major employment center. Uh, they generally only operate during peak hours, they don't have all day service. Uh, if we look at the productivity stats here. Um, I'll call your attention to the 64. Um, you know, we there there's some kind of negative trends there in terms of passengers per trip um, and cost per passenger. Uh, it's worth noting that prior to our September 21 booking, um, we were seeing ridership trending up. So we decided to add service to meet what appears to be a need or a demand. Um, however, when we added that service in the September booking, the additional demand did not materialize. So you can see that kind of lower productivity. Uh, we'd like to increase service, but not the same relative increase in ridership. Uh, and then looking down to 95, uh, you know, we have highlighted in red the cost per passenger as being underperforming relative to its peers at $46.87 per passenger. Um, you know, move on quickly to on-time performance. Um, our on-time performance is defined as a bus leaving a time point. So it's not every stop, it's just the time points as articulated uh, in the schedule. Uh, leaving that either a minute or more early or over five minutes late. So for quarter three, our performance, our OTP performance was at 68.7%. Uh, and you know that number is going to be a little different than what Tim said because Tim is providing the March data 
whereas this is the full quarter, uh, you know, January, February, and March. Uh, if we look at the breakdown of that on-time performance, uh, here you'll see weekday and weekend on-time performance. Uh, they're pretty similar, but you know, we like to break them out to kind of keep an eye on things, look for places we can improve. Uh, operations has been working diligently on eliminating the earlies because that's something that we really can control. Uh, whereas late, you know, it might be traffic or something that's impacting that. Uh, so earlies, we've been focusing on that. Uh, we have made progress quarter over quarter. Uh, the weekday percentage of earlies went from 10.6 down to 8, 10.6% down to 8.7%. So we are bringing that down. Uh, you know, hopefully we can get close to zero. Uh, if, we, if we did transfer all of our earlies on time, uh, that would put us up around, I believe, 76, 77%, a lot closer to our benchmark of 8%. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my report and open it up to questions. Thanks, Sam. All right, next is, uh, what do we got? Tony Carney will now go over the safety components of the March. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Anthony Carter. Most people call me Tony. I'm the director of risk management here at uh, GRTC. I'll be going on the safety performance report for the month of March. Uh, before you have the actual report, it's found on page 40 through 44 of the board packet. However, I'll go over some key indicators of the report. Starting with the results for this month, uh, external events. In February, we had 48. In March, we had 34. Non-preventable incidents, in February, we had 29. In March, we had 19. Preventable, in February, we had 19. In March, we had 15. We did have two rear end accidents in the month of February, as well as two rear end accidents in the month of March, meaning that a vehicle rear end the bus. So as you can see, from the month of February to the month of March, we did have a very good decrease, and we always look um, for the decreases and what we can do to improve those, those uh, scores. Specialized care, passenger events, we had zero. Traffic events, we had seven. Three were preventable, four were non preventable. And these were minor accidents, um, such things such as tree limbs and fences and things of that nature, no major injuries, and no major damage. Assaults on fixed routes. We did have three verbal assaults. Uh, one was an actual assault between the operator and the passenger. Uh, the other one, the other two were actual inappropriate languages where situations where things got out of hand and people used some foul language, but there was uh, nothing between the actual operator or the passenger. It was more like between uh, two passengers. Physical assaults, we did have one physical assault that took place between an operator and a passenger, and the other one was between two passengers. On the care side, we had zero verbal assaults and zero physical assaults. We continue to do online training. Um, it's still mentioned verbal de-escalation. Virtual platforms is what we really push it for our operators, giving them the opportunity to take their classes online. It gives us a lot of support so far as what to say, what not to say, how to de-escalate the situation. Also, as Tim mentioned, we did start a series of in-person safety meetings this week. Uh, we had a real good time last night. Officer Alameen with Richmond Police Department and Community Cares Act uh, assisted with that. And he came and gave a lot of uh, stories that he had so far as how he handled certain situations and how it relates to operators and what they deal with on an everyday basis. Um, like I said, we got a lot of good feedback, a lot of good numbers, and we continue with that uh, this week. And with that, concludes my uh, safety performance report. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Oh, Is that it? Just um, what would be an example of a non preventable passenger incident that's bus related? A uh, situation where someone was standing on the bus and um, the bus took off and the person fell. I'm sorry, 
you asked what would be a preventable or not preventable? I asked whether not preventable, though. No. Uh, bus related. So a, a non preventable, uh, that you confirmed that that's a non preventable? Yes, it's just something that the operator has to do with in the old. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, I misheard the. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, anything else? No, this is all right. So there's a three minute break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we have a coffee break. It's a goodness break now. We're going to bring everybody back up to us. <laughs>
Yeah, okay. So this is Tony Bird. We'll give our final report to our outreach and maintenance from the maintenance department. Mr. Bird, Mr. Owen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I uh, have the maintenance report that's now in the board package, page 45. Our KPIs for the month of March are 6,036 miles between roll calls, which is higher than the established miles of 5,200. Our PMs for the month of March were 96% of a goal of 80%. For the month of March, we averaged 20% of complete down for service and repair. With a spare ratio of 20%. We also have a 15% contingency plan. We've hired three more technicians, two body shop techs, one foreman, one part time bus cleaner, and a make and the maintenance department last month. We've also hired two more as of yesterday. Current levels of staffing for mechanics, we have three existing staff is 21 with six vacancies. The body shop existing staff is three with five vacancies. And general services is existing staff 13 with two vacancies. We continue to clean and disinfect the entire crew daily and power clean each and power wash each bus shelter. That ends the maintenance report. I have any questions. That cleaning is that still jobbed out or are we doing that ourselves? We're doing it ourselves on the bus stops. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Bird. Any questions? Uh, we now we move into the numbers. <coughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Zuzarella. Page 46 in your package, you will find the February 2022 financial report. Um, so moving right over to slide uh, 47 on page 47, it's the source of funds for year to date, February 28, 2022. Uh, for the eight months ended February uh, 22, revenues are on payroll to budget by $4.61 million on a budget of $42.14 million, so it's short about 10.93%. Um, as you look at the report, the directly generated revenues uh, is on payroll $86,000 on a budget of $1.98 million, and it's based upon favorable advertising revenues of $146,000 offset by the unfavorable university past revenue about 136,000. Uh, this shortfall is originated in July, started in July of 2021, as, as we had a service reduction. Uh, we had to no folks at DCU at that time. We did have an agreed upon reduction of what the monthly fee would be. They came back up to enrollment in the August, September, so that went away. However, with the service change in December, um, we reduced the frequency of the route, therefore, uh, the incentive portion of the contract was suspended for the back for starting throughout the middle of December through the balance of this fiscal year. So that's what's generating the unfavorable uh, revenue variance there in the university pass program. Uh, and the the other the down in the unfavorable other agency revenue, one hundred fourteen thousand dollars, is due to unfavorable interest income, and that was just most likely a overstatement of what was expected for interest income. We didn't have the value, the volume of cash uh, to support that amount of return. Uh, looking down at the local government funds, they're slightly favorable to budget, about one hundred seven thousand dollars on a budget of twenty one point five two million. This is basically in there as your local operating contribution from the city of Richmond, the county of Mike and Chesterfield, uh, and any local portion of uh, the, the grant matches. Uh, state government funds are essentially on budget contributions, the amount of the budget around 8.2 million. And the federal funds uh, are on favorable $4.61 million on a budget of 10.4 million. And this is primarily uh, the result of our operating expenses being below budget levels of $4.27 million. So the majority of the revenue shortfall is in the federal funds and you know it's 
driven by the uh, below budget operating expenses because at that portion of, of uh, whether it be CARES Act, CRISA, ARPA, or any PM or ADA flex, it's on a reimbursement basis. So as as the two fiscal 2022 budget was established, it's a break even on a monthly basis. And we're following the federal worksheet uh, aspect where you list out your operating expenses and then you do your subtractions of your other revenue sources, which comes down to a net unfunded amount. And then we've been applying based upon the uh, adopted fiscal 22 budget, as well as in conjunction, conjunction with the approved regional public transportation plan, which is approved by both by this board as well as CBK, is how we've been doing our allocation of revenue. So moving over to slide. John, yes. uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm fully grasping that. So essentially, the, the reduction in federal funds is directly tied to the reduction in whether you call it revenue miles or, or, or sorry, so operating you know, expenses. So that it's it done on expense, not on uh, yeah. per mile basis. Yeah. So with you know, sixty-five percent of our operating expenses, as Mr. Barnes has told you, it is excluded is our human capital portion mm -hmm. plus assets. So when you have significant, what we'll see in the next slides, you'll see that the majority of the four point two million dollars of operating expense being below a budget is driven by lack of people. So when you have lack of people, you have lack of health care, pension, as well as uh, FICA taxes. So when you go through and we uh, uh, through the CARES Act, we had the CARES Act echo review came in and, and we had a successful audit with them and they're, they're uh, stressing for utilization of COVID relief funds, all three of them, the uh, CARES Act, CRISA, as well as ARPA, once the program, the program for primarily for operating expenses and the methodology that the ECHO reviewers have outlined is that they prefer a, a utilization of an FTA worksheet expense reimbursement basis, which we do follow on a monthly basis. Um, our goal when we come to the codes and books for each month is to basically break even because our budget is revenue is equal to expenses. So when we go through the prioritization, we're following the FTA worksheet where you take your operating expenses and you add your, uh, you subtract some of your, 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 your income items uh, and, and then uh, your operating contributions. And then what it does is it leaves a net expense. So if there's a net expense, then we, based upon what type of expenses we utilize either our programs, uh, 5307, PM Flex, ADA Flex, or if it's one of the line items that the, the, the GRTC board had approved uh, as expenditure categories for use of CARES, CRIS, or ARPA, then we apply that break even and then we go about and file for FD reimbursement and receive the funds the next day from the FDA. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to slide over to uh, just, just uh, for orientation. Slide 49 is what we'll call the eye chart. That's there, and the only reason it's in this package is so you can see how that whole schedule comes together. What we really focus on is the summary portion on pages 50 and 51, and then the other between 52 and 59 are for functional area detail. I usually talk from the from the from the uh, summary, but I just uh, want you to put the the eye chart in there so you can see how the whole chart pulls together. So moving over to slide on you know, page 50, which is the summary. Uh, I actually go down to 51 on the bottom, as you can see here. Down on the bottom right hand corner, the total expenses are are less than budget amounts by 4.267 million on a budget of. Uh, 41.77 million. So going right up to the top, this is the summary of all GRTC operations. So you'll see in the other uh, pages 52 to 59, there's a section for, for operations. There's one for vehicle maintenance, one for facility maintenance, and one for GNA that breaks down in the same format. This is kind of the, the NTD structure format of uh, this presentation. So right at the top here on page 50, you'll see um, the operating costs for labor with three point 035 million less than budget. So what's driving that primarily, if you look, you can see the pieces down between 52 and 59, but I'm going to recite them right here. Um, vehicle operations uh, labor is $1.31 million less than budget. And that's primarily, uh, you'll see it in, in the salaries and wages of the operators of 1.02 million, 108,000 
uh, less than budget and supervisor salary, and the balance of that is about three hundred forty thousand dollars for fringe benefits, for the fringe is for health care and pension. The company provided pension contribution as well as the the, the, the three various other medical. Um, as you as as you heard, I'm I'm trailing what Tim Barnum had presented, so I'm on February, so the numbers may not sync up a little bit, but at the month of February. The transportation uh, operations department was 23 positions below budget and headcount. So that's what basically driving the large labor uh, variance. Um, and then vehicle maintenance and facility maintenance departments, when you combine the two of them together, labor is $620,000 favorable. Um, and you know, that's in the actual maintenance salaries of about $444,000. And their fringe portion is about $215,000. And once again, that's as uh, Mr. Bird had cited, that he's you know, he found heads. He found about 17 positions between the, the vehicle and the facility maintenance, and that's what's driving that. And the third uh, basic bucket is on the general administrative side for about a million dollars with labor variance, of which about 496,000 is is the uh, salaries and wages component. The balance of 611 is the fringe benefits, and this is due to the 2022 budget that. Have obviously, positions in it that are currently unfilled. So, as you come further down this, this on page 50, down to what will be now in the middle of the page of the services line, you'll see that services is favorable about $858,000 on a budget of $2.12 million, and that's you know, primarily being driven by building maintenance and uh, the timing of advertising promotion advertising promotion campaigns in the amount of $165,000. So building maintenance has been something that has been favorable to budget for the majority of this, of this year. Um, it comes to the prioritization of projects versus what was the assumptions were when the budget was put together and calendarized. Advertising pro, pro, uh, promotion expenses, these are yeah, usually the expenses that uh, you know, recruiting campaigns, since it's just probably the timing of them relative to the calendarization, not, not much concern on that. In the uh, uh, materials and services consumed section, going a little bit further, you'll see that it's unfavorable year to date about $450,000. Uh, this we kind of turned, and previously we were about we we're about on budget, but this month, it kind of in the month of February, it took a turn. It's primarily due to materials and lubricants was about two hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars, and what's in there is uh, which is driving a good piece of that is a true up to the CNG billing from our uh, CNG fueling facility to relationship with Trillium. Um, there was a catch up invoice from uh, that, that uh, basically there's a true up of rates that covered from the period of January 2020 through September 2021. That's $186,000. And um, in addition to that, there was about unfavorable in a month was about $156,000 for the purchase of uh, vehicle parts and equipment and other equipment supplies of $74,000. Inflation and supply chain issues are, are putting pressure on the pricing of parts, so that's one part of it. Another part of it could be the timing of it versus the calendarization. With respect to the CNG portion, it was the true up. Um, and looking at the, at the CNG rate changes, uh, in the trillion contract from 2014 to 2021, it's, it's one point, has a company growth rate of 1.71. So it's not dramatic, it's just true up was applied relative to um, the budget at that point in the calendarization. We're going to keep an eye on it. We're going to take a look at We do buy our natural gas from the city of Richmond, and we're, we're going to monitor all these just to make sure that we're appropriate uh, and there's no other anomalies. Uh, a little bit further down, moving on to page 51. You'll see the casualty the liability cost line is about 512,000 versus the budget. The fiscal 22 budget was put together uh, with the assumption that we would go directly out to our insurance brokers with their policies. Uh, under the good work of Mr. Carter, we got ourselves involved with the Virginia General Liability Pool. Therefore, the, this is, is you know, the premiums that were afforded for certain policies through that are far. Uh, more cost efficient than going direct. So good work there. Um, then going down further on the uh, the taxes line. Uh, I'm sorry. Skip over. Purchase transportation is federal about three hundred ninety nine thousand dollars. This is uh, more or less. This is our spec transfer services, and this is more or less based on demand. There is 
an invoice that's going to come in probably in the month of March that will absorb some leftover ability, which was basically a retroactive rate increase based on the medium contract that has been going back and forth with us in the first round of the bigger resolution. And that should be in that a little bit. You'll see that next month. Um, and then going down uh, uh, down the taxes line, tax, uh, I'm sorry, taxes are included, but pretty much, uh, you know, uh, the miscellaneous expense is unfavorable, about $58,000. And this is just, this is more of a budget conversation of the timing of membership fees, uh, debt, debt expenses, and you know, not, not an issue to worry about at this point. Um, so to slide down to slide 63. This is basically the full, the full income statement. So on a year-to-date basis, you'll see here at the top under the operating revenue, um, payable to budget by $15,908. And in here, you'll see the top line, the past program revenue, that's where we talk about the VCU um, contract revenue. That's where you see that. You'll see two lines below at the 146941 favorable. That's the, uh, the advertising revenue versus budget. That's what's it's driving that. Dropping down to the other income, it's unfair about 102,000 versus budget. As you can see, it's the interest in, interest income line. We just that was just a bad bad assumption in the budget. The cash balances are nowhere near yours. The investment uh, you know, outside of LG could never give that kind of yield. That's been modified, as you'll see in the fiscal 23 uh, draft budget. Dropping down to the operating contribution to the 4.5 million dollars. Uh, $5.2 million on payroll versus uh, budget. That's you know, primarily, as you see, it's in the COVID relief funds as well as the operating countries of federal. That's the, you know, based upon our operating expenses. But if you look a couple lines down, you can see our operating expenses are, are less than budget by 4.267 million. Overall, for the column in the month, we'll see that year to date for about $79,880. Um, Surplus versus present versus expenses. Moving along to slide 64. So this is our balance sheet as of this is our balance sheet as of February 28, uh, 2022. The call outs on here, you'll see the the Column far right, that's our balance. That's a June 30th, 2021. The prior month, obviously, is January 31st. So you kind of see the trend in the cash position about 4.1 million uh, in a month of February. We have an operating cycle in cash, We're usually higher at the beginning of the quarter when we work our way down. Um, we are uh, you know, kind of a stronger position than we are than at the previous uh, year end. Uh, as you can see, you know, cash went down from the prior month, but that's basically because of January, the end of, end of January, we, were, we received a reimbursement for the, uh, the Gillick buses that we procured, and then we paid the expense in February. So that's was the balance why that came down primarily. Um, you can see that the accounts receivable balance went up. Um, that is uh, due to, we were waiting for the programming of our CRISA, Grants, uh, CRISA, CRISA relief funds, as well as our PM and ADA grants. So uh, those came through in the month of March. So what we were doing is we were booking, booking the receivable in the month of December, January, February, and those that will be processed here in the month of April. Uh, going down, you know, call outs on here. You'll see the deferred, the deferred, the restricted funds, the 21 million 460. That's the um, the revenues from CBTA that we receive on a monthly basis that are not uh, that were that are put away for the, the next uh, fiscal year. Overall, no concerns on the balance sheet, uh, relatively strong. Moving to slide 65, this is our cash flow projection. So it shows our February actual, as, as you can see in the left column in the top part, vehicle purchases were about 5.864 million of. The beginning balance uh, at the, uh, of the balance at the, at, at, you know, at, the, at the end of January. Um, you, as I mentioned before, you'll see March, there is no federal reimbursement coming, and that's basically coming through in the month of April. Uh, 
as you can see from the standpoint, we had a low, low, uh, low, at the low point of our cash at the end of March, which is expected because at the beginning of the, of the new quarter, we get our funding and transfer it over to CBK, which you see in April of 4 million nine twenty five. So we're kind of, we follow a sawtooth cash flow and um, obviously you know, we look out the, we look out at least 90 days and, and take any corrective action if there's a need to draw upon the reserve or so forth, we would bring that forth to the court and give authorization. But as you can see, there's no need in, in fiscal 22, we haven't had any need to draw in any uh, reserves. Um, moving down to slide 66. CDTA, there's a requirement for on uh, GRPC and the other member towns. We have to report on a quarterly basis as well as the annual report. Um, our MO, MOA is a little bit different than the member towns. Ours is a 45 day reporting requirement. So at the end of March, activity I have until May 15th to report. So this is basically the finalized details of the CDTA activity for our quarter. So we started the balance at it started with $20.98 million at the end of December. And then up in the top, you'll see the monthly receipts of the distribution, which represents our 15% that received. And then there's the next, we invest basically the entirety of the receipts in the LGIP extended maturity. There's, uh, there's interest income that comes in as well as the share price adjustments. So in the account, we, we, we adjust to market each month. And then down here, the, the middle part is the uses. There's two categories of uses that we've been utilizing that have occurred. Um, you know, using uh, our external consultant, we conducted the fiscal 23 GRTC regional public transportation plan. Uh, it's, it's ongoing and will be brought to this board and then ultimately the CBTA's board for approval. That is a document that basically dictates what we will be spending our operating capital expenditures for the fiscal and in addition, down below, we also incurred uh, costs in the amount of $75,000 uh, for an outside consultant for the GRTC micro uh, mobility plan. Also, in this quarter here, you can see that the, the amounts that were allocated are moved over from the dedicated CBTA account over to GRTC operating and capital expenses for the quarter in the total of $4.925 so at the end of the quarter, we're at 23 million five hundred <coughs> balance, of which the allocations of it is there's a still a residual balance of about 38,671 in for the regional public transportation plan for fiscal 21. There's a balance for the regional public transportation plan of uh, fiscal 22, and then some balance of about 74,000 left on the regional building plan at the balance of 23,700. 23239 that's being held um, for our Q4 of uh, fiscal 22, as well as the balance, you know, the, the anything outside of that goes into fiscal 23. And now at the bottom, you can see that at the end of March 31st, there was 5.36 million that was in the Wells Fargo account with the balance of 18135 in the LGEM. Basically, the majority of the 5.3 Six six for roughly four point nine two five was transferred over to the operating on April one because that would be our fourth quarter plan. So uh, that's this report could be collapsed a little bit. So not all the detail, and we'll file it. We'll we'll send that to the CBTA probably after this meeting and uh, in, in advance of the date of the deadline. And then at this at this point, that kind of concludes my finance report. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Mr. Chair, a quick question. What, you, did I hear you say your CBTA money is on the reserves? Our CB, we, we hold our CBTA money. The way, the, the way that we have orchestrated in our regional public transportation plan, we'll collect, what we collect in fiscal 22, we, 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 it's unearned revenue to us. It's dedicated for July 1st to 22 through June 30th of 2023. So it's held. I can use the reserve, it's, it's held as restricted for the next year. It's not a reserve fund. So we're basically holding it and then running it a year later. And then I don't know if we'll ever be able to speed that up or not, how that will work. But that's that's what we did. There was no guarantee that uh, CBTA would come out with a, an operational plan fast enough 
approved at the board that uh, that we could use. So we were afraid to uh, to spend it the second we got it. So the five million dollars yeah. that we got, the five million dollars that we received in March, right? Four point whatever. You're holding it until July one. 22 for the next fiscal year. We accumulate, yes, we're holding everything else. So, so in this balance that was in there, we only had, because this was us March 31st, we had one more quarter of funding in that, and four, which would be April 1 through June 30th of 2022. So that balance was in Wells Fargo account basically is, was for fiscal 22. Everything that was in LGA BM is basically there waiting starting July 1 of 2022 for the four that probably Three quarters. I think normally, uh, by the way that the collections come in CBTA, what we get through you know, to, for the full year, we have to accumulate through August. Do it. Yeah. Tell us. So, just a history of CBTA funding to GRTC. Uh, the first year that CBTA funding was collected was, of course, the end of the year. We couldn't, we did not feel that it was. Uh, available to us to use that year uh, to be able to to budget to use money as it comes in the door when you don't know how much is coming in the door you don't know what you're going to cable so each what we have done is in effect look at for each fiscal year look at collecting during a fiscal year and that is the budget that we would carry forward into the next fiscal year's plan so for last this current fiscal year we used the collections from FY21, which we believe at the time would be about $18 million. We know if we needed about $21 million for maintenance of service, we supplemented the difference with the CARES Act funding. For next year, you'll see the accumulation here right now. We have approximately $23 million that's accumulated. Some of that will get used. Some of it will just more that will come in. We should end the year in FY22 at around $28 million, I believe, is the projection. That 28 million, 21 of that will be used in our FY23 budget. So that way we're sure that we have a cash flow to pay our operations and our bills. As you saw, we cycle through it. We're always using the prior year accumulation for the current year. That also helps us to weather through uh, changes to the economy, changes to the tax base, changes to other needs. Uh, we know that we have that money available and it allows us to budget without having to worry about not being able to pay our operators. But you said planning for 23 to spend 21 of the 28 that has been collected in FY22? Yes, and we'll talk about that when we get the regional public transportation plan. As you saw in our, our report, and we talked about it in detail, we don't have enough operators to make our normal service. We don't believe we'll have enough operators to expand. So the amount of money that we will use in our regional public transportation plan is the amount to continue to maintain our existing service and that the delta would be set aside in the restricted fund so that when we do have enough operators and we do have the priorities, we can then use that money to expand. So I just want to repeat this one more time while I'm here. Yes. In FY22, GRTC is, is collecting and depositing in the restricted account $28 million of CBTA revenue. In the best case scenario, you anticipate being able to operationalize 21 million of that 28, and the delta of seven would be held in further time periods for future deployment into regional expansion, et cetera, which we have not as a board yet determined what that regional expansion will be. That is correct. Thank you. All right, just making sure. So just just to clarify that to show right down here, I know it's a lot of hard This number down here. That's 18135. That's in the L shift. So we've got that's as of March. So we've got April, May, and June, so three months. The average value, anywhere from 2.2 to 2.5. Let's say I can't get the math in my head. Let's say it's 2.5, that'll be seven and a half. Add seven and a half on that, you're at 25.6. So that's where by June 30th, we should have about 25.6 in that for our available for July 1st of 20. Sorry, the final one, 22 for fiscal 23 CBT. So whether or not we collect 25 million or 28 million, of course, we won't know until June. Any further questions? And this is the first year that we're doing a carryover. Because you only have CBT money for what, two years? 
we started collecting, the region started collecting it in FY21 uh, into the year. So it didn't start immediately. I believe it started in October of 2020, which was in fiscal year 21. We continue to reserve that money to put it into our FY22 budget as our first year of use, using it. And we got our first distributions in February and March of 2021. I think I got that right. I think I said it correctly. Yeah, I mean, there was October 1, and one of them was July 1. The CBTA legislation was the governor amended the start dates and the amount when COVID hit to uh, adjust for sales tax and gas use when it was collected and how much for the first year. Right, but the usage of the seven million as the delta is determined by this board and not by the legislation. It will be determined by this board in well in the past okay. it has been determined by this board. So the decision to hold the seven million was determined by those who are on this board. Correct. And your recommendation. Yes. Okay. And in collaboration with the TPO and with the approval of the CBTA. Okay. It's not just this board. We have actually a significant amount of coordination that has to go through before we get to that point. Okay. Thank you, John. So next, um, oh, Tanya, Ms. Thompson. Yes, Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Welcome to our new members. Um, I will be reviewing the upcoming procurements on, found on pages 67 and 68 of your board report. We've recently added four new projects to the report. So you'll see a list of several projects, but typically what I do during the board meetings is highlight um, the new projects that I have been informed of between last board meeting and our current board meeting. Um, so I'd like to highlight four projects for you at this time. Our planning department has two new projects they would like to bring to you this summer for award. The first project is an e-sign pilot project. Staff desires to install e-paper signs and e-paper kiosks at select stops to evaluate the performance of real-time electronic signage technology. The signs will display schedule information, customer alerts, and predictive real-time arrival information. The plan is to install 12 e-signs and two e-kiosks at the new downtown transfer plaza, and either an e-sign or an e-kiosk at 10 local stops each year for the next five years. The estimated cost of this project is $1,290,000. This project is in the FY23 capital budget and the status of the funds is pending. That means that staff is awaiting the approval of funds from our funding sources. Additionally, planning would also like to conduct an origin to destination survey to gather information on travel patterns and socioeconomic characteristics of our riders. The estimated cost of this project is $290,000, and funding for this project is also pending. GRTC's risk management department would like to conduct a security risk assessment focusing on our administrative and maintenance buildings. The assessment will identify security defects and vulnerabilities and assist staff in implementing security controls. The estimated cost of this project is $20,000, and it is in a planned status, which means staff will be applying for the funding in the future. Lastly, the maintenance and facility department would like to have all HVAC mechanical equipment assessed to develop a plan for repairs or replacement in order to keep the system in optimal operational condition. 
We are in the early planning phases of this project and staff will be developing a cost estimate and identifying funding in the near future in order to provide you with an anticipated award time frame. This concludes my report. Are there any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. <laughs> So we, um, Mr. Chair, are we voting on this? No. Okay. So what? This so, basically, um, announcement is just a report of upcoming or recent procurements that are either in the process or we plan to uh, begin within the next few months, just mm -hmm. to give the board an idea of what we're planning, mm -hmm. and also to let the community know, community of vendors specifically know. Um, Hey, check out our website. These are some projects to come so that we can get uh, the most competition um, that we're But if you do get a, a potential contract on one of these, it will come before the board, uh, yes. assuming it's over 50,000. If it's over 50,000, yeah. it'll go to Reverend Campbell. If it's over 100,000, currently, that's what our procurement manual, that's, that's what it states, mm -hmm. it would go to the full board. But I would report on it each month. Anything between 50 and 100. So, would you just share with us? Um, so, these are possible, uh, so these are potential projects that have come. Yes, sir. RFP to go out, and then once contracts need to be signed, then in, in, in future board meetings, these will be action items. Right. Okay. And they, uh, the funding on these is separate from the operational budget. These are mostly funded out of. Uh, separate capital funds Mostly, um, yeah. that are available. The report will identify the funding source. Uh, so it's not a part of these budgets that we just went over with John. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, yeah, as, Julie. as an example, uh, on page 67, you would see the one, two, three, four fund out of specialized transportation services. That is our care service. Our care transit is actually out right now in the procurement process. Um, it's, it will come out of our operating budget, but before that is awarded, it has to have a recommendation and we'll come to this board for final approval. But that, it just lets you know where we are. With but that's an operating piece, right? That is yeah. an operating one specific. That's probably one of our biggest operating yeah. um, So if I look down the last column, pending existing plan, um, does that mean, has some of these already been approved? If they're state pending, it's been approved? Yes, sir. If you look on the bottom of page 68, there's a key for you. I know it's kind of hard to keep all of it together. Um, but plans uh, means that these are projects that uh, staff has identified, but we have not even applied for funds at that yet. Um, so in the other ones, ready, of course, means we've got the funds in house. It can be applied to the project. Um, but if it's pending or existing. How does that relate to board approval? Where does board approval occur in that four in that four thing? It really doesn't. It just it's just giving you the the source <clears throat> of the funds and where we are as far as the application process is concerned. Or grants. Yeah. So this that column in particular, uh, it's the grant status. So before we go out for a project. Knowing that we have the, the money in house, we already have the grant, it's been applied for, it's received, we have an existing grant, uh, it's ready to go. So those things you might expect to see move a little bit faster. Those that say that they're uh, they're pending or planned, it means we still have to go and get the funding and get approvals. So while we're planning on it, and it's it, it really is contingent upon us getting the funding, getting the uh, the art on the street getting the vendors competitively bid and then coming back. But everything on here is over $50,000 would have to come back to this board for a few At some point. At some point. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Uh, who's next here? I am next. You are next. I don't know. I'll get the hot seat.
Unfortunately, it's a little bit lengthy, so I'm going to go through it super fast and probably skip over some slides. If there's information I'm going too fast, please let me know. But I do want to be conscious of the amount of time this board meeting is taking and be sensitive to that since we do have some other action to take before we're done. So, specifically, this action item, or not action, this discussion item, will look at our capital program between FY23 and FY26. There is no action for you on this plan. Is, is to give you an awareness about how we use our capital funds, our, specifically our federal funds, how we match them with state resources, how we match them with local resources, and how much money we use of that in our operating budget year over year, and what that delta is. So that when you're making decisions on the operating and the capital budget, you can see the downstream multi-year consequences of those policy decisions in our current fiscal year coming up in FY23. So when we look at the first thing that you'll see is we'll talk a little bit about the 5307, 5339, those are federal formula funds that we receive from the federal government. Uh, they're to be used for capital. 5307 tends to have a very broad amount of use. We can flex that into our operating budget. And I'll show you how we do that in a few minutes. We receive usually <coughs> around $10 million a year in that 5307. And we tend to, you'll see in the budget, flex as much as we can into operating. The remainder of it in the budget is about $3 million. We use that to leverage against our state grant applications. So a lot of those procurements that you saw on the capital side are actually funded, many of them, with a 68% state match, which means our federal money is only funding about 28% of it and 4% local. So I'll keep talking about um, so every every dollar that we push from our 5307 into our operating budget means that there's about two and a half dollars that we don't uh, we can't get from the states for matching. So in general, those those percentages, the 5307, when we use the money for any project, is somewhere between that 28 to 80 percent funds a project, depending on our uh, success with DRPP grants. Capital projects are tend to be funded between zero to 50, 50 for most of our uh, uh, studies and operational system type projects. I, I can't remember the words, but I'm going to move on. 68% for our capital uh, projects like a bus, um, bus technology, bus safety and repair, and then it usually requires a 4% local match. We receive that money from the CBTA allocations as well as a proportion of the local allocations we receive from our partner jurisdictions so the fund to make that 4% match work. Um, eligible activities, again, I'm very broad. 5307 has a wide range of eligible activities. Uh, the 5307, as I said, for every million dollars transferred to operations for preventive maintenance and ADA means we lose the opportunity for two point, uh, for three million in the state match for the capital needs. Uh, 5339 is another category that we simply use. That's for bus and bus replacement. It cannot be flexed into our operations, so that stands alone. We tend to get it in there around one, two, one, five million dollars a year. This is the, the breakdown where I want to spend a little bit more time as it relates to the long-term implications of flexing money into our operational budget from the 5307. So you do have this on your uh, in the in your handout if this is too far away or uh, too small. The first two columns of uh, the 5307 reflects to ops and the 5307 reflects to ADA to ops. What that means is that for the flex to ops, the 8.3 million, we are allowed to, we're eligible to categorize our expenses as preventive maintenance. And uh, for us, we tend to have approximately $10 million of preventive maintenance expenses. That's our bus repair and our mechanic salaries and the parts. We can flex 80% of that cost from 5307 into us, but no more than 80%. 8.3 for FY23 represents that 80% of expected expenses in preventative maintenance. Now, the ADA flex 
we can flex up to 10% of 5307 over for ADA. That can help pay for our care service for other paratransit services. That again is also the maximum we can flex. So in the budget that you'll see later today for FY23, we are proposing and recommending the maximum flex that we can put in of 9.5 into our FY23 operational budget. What that means is that we'll only have 7 million approximately less in the capital side to match against those state and other opportunities. 5339 is 1.4. Assuming we get that 68% match from the, the states, some of them are 50, but we're just going to go conservative here. What that leaves us with is about $15.6 million to fund our standard <coughs> capital expenses for FY23. Uh, and that's year over year, so not looking at any rollover. But in general, under this policy, we have about $15 million to spend on our capital needs year over year. Uh, we have a strategy for how we identify what those capital needs are and how we put them in buckets to make sure that we are doing the highest priority. Uh, we look at uh, maximizing the amount of money that we can get to put against federal funds. So we want to maximize all of the money we have to leverage against state, other federal, federal <coughs> opportunities. Uh, we want to maintain our assets in good, a state of good repair, uh, improve the service, look at mobility initiatives. We look at all the different projects that come out of our partners, out of our public, out of the TPO, the jurisdictions. We look at them in basically five buckets, one through five. So one through three, you'll see in a, in a few minutes, uh, those projects that are shovel ready or mission critical, they have the top of the list. The ones at the bottom of the list are the ones that really the, the information might be a little bit squishier, technical term. We don't necessarily have the engineering done. We're not ready. It's not shovel ready. North South BRT would be an example. The capital investment in North South BRT would have been an example of level five. We don't have enough information to know what the ends of it, how much it might cost. So that would be unfunded. But what you'll see in a minute is one through three is proposed to continue funding every year. Four and five are proposed to stay in an unfunded list. They're also broken up when we do that into seven categories. So sometimes you'll see these categories one through seven. Um, that is when we tier them. So if something is shovel ready, if it's shovel ready but it's an expansion and it's high, it'll be in a seven. Safety regulatory training is always our first priority. A committed project, that's a project where if you have funding one year but you need another money, in the second year to finish it, it was a multi-year project, you would always make sure you have that funding available to complete the project. The PM ADA transfer that we talked about is three. So we want to maximize the amount we put in and whatever is left goes into state of good repair. That's our fleet replacement. Buses are expensive and they have to be replaced every 12 years. Our business improvements, that's how effective we are managing the business itself and supporting our staff in the business of running transit. Service improvements, that, that's how effective or efficient we are in making sure that our riders have good service for their existing service. And then system expansion, high capacity, that's if we want to do more, more shelters, uh, longer routes, uh, more buses to expand high capacity BRT. Um, the projects where they come from, they come from a wide range of sources. This is my chart. Mm -hmm. so, you have it there. It's not intended for you to go through and look at every single project at the second, but please do take some time to visit when you have a moment. This shows you the, the projects that are on this list that we would propose for funding from 23 to 26. What you will see is that many of them are repeat year over year. They are have to do with IT equipment that's a technology on our buses, the replacement on our buses, the IT uh, support for this building itself. Many of those are just recurring costs year over year that we just have to do or else we will not be able to operate. This is the category one, that's it, or the category one through five. These are the category ones, the top shovel ready mission critical type of projects in general. Uh, categories two and three, again, there's, there's fewer there, and then the categories four and five. Some of these, this is where you're going to see approximately $200 million worth of unfunded needs, that North South BRT, the downtown transfer plaza. Little Lawn Park and Ride, the Church Lot, Southside Transfer Plaza, large projects that we know as a region we have to invest in, but we currently don't have a strategy for how we invest in them. Those are on the unfunded list until we come up with policies for that. 
when you look at what that looks like, this is where the, the next key uh, level is, is that the bars represent those categories of one, two, and three, the ones that we really need to fund, with the blue being that first page, the mission critical, the state of good repair for our buses, the transit technology, the fleet replacement. The yellow line is that 15, 15 and a half million dollars of reasonably expected federal money. And you can see that year over year, we're about making it. There is no excess in there. So the money that we're flexing into operations is money that can't be used for this. Now, the good news is just like CBT, we're about a, a year or two behind. So we have some flexibility to move over. And we also have some flexibility to go after <coughs> other state dis discretionary grants, federal grants to reduce that burden and to balance it. So looking at this allows us to do that. Can yes, I ask a question? So prior to CARES Act and CBTA, I mean, how were you surviving? I mean, you, I mean, no, seriously. I mean, you, with local money, state money, federal money, and you got the CBTA money, and you got the CARES Act money, and it still seems like the organization was struggling. I, I'm, I think maybe I'm missing something, but how were you surviving prior to CARES Act and CBTA? Prior to the CBTA money, uh, that we had significantly higher allocation from our local jurisdictions. We had uh, twice as amount, uh, the amount from Richmond and twice the amount from Enrico. Every year when we went through the process of our local operational budget, we went into coordination with each of those jurisdictions to talk about the price of, of that service and how much would be funded by those localities, how much would be offset by state and federal resources. And so each year when we came up with the budget, we put out the service that we could afford based on the allocations provided to us. Julie, the delta on the local matches was is totals twelve million. Eight from the city. Yeah, we've also got twelve. Oh yes, yes. yes. Versus Sorry. again, we discussed yeah. twenty eight yes. CBTA. I just want to put it in front. No, I think that's no, that's a really that's, that, that's a, a good framework to talk about, and I know that's a little bit off topic here, but uh, again, for background, to talk through what happened with. CBTA and COVID and what happened to our budget. Pre-CBTA, pre-COVID, we were operating around a $55, $56 million budget annually. And when uh, COVID hit and CBTA hit pretty much at the same time, we had to adjust. Now, the amount of money that was coming from the city and from the counties and the amount of money going forward is based on their FY19 budgets from a few years ago. Going through FY20, FY21, FY22, our expenses continue to grow because of COVID-related cleaning of our buses, operator increases through contract with the union, um, other needs to keep our service safe and clean, the additional cleaning we do in the facility and at our bus shelter. So our expenses continue to grow, but our local allocations were uh, kept flat at that FY19 level until next year, at which point we'll be able to increase them with CPI. The delta between there, um, we have been looking to become more efficient and more effective to try and keep our costs down. But yes, the CARES Act money has helped to fill that hole until the CBTA could come back and replace it. And now the CBTA money is taking that burden. We also had CARES back then. We did. And right now the CARES and the, uh, for FY21 and FY22, the delta created by fares is being covered by the money from the CARES Act and the ARPA money moving forward that would either have to have fares come back or it would have to be covered from another source, which we'll talk about later. All right, so what, I, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is, and maybe I'm hearing it wrong, mm -hmm. the reduction in what the local governments were giving is more than what the CBTA is contributing. Am I hearing that wrong? Opposite. The CBTA contribution is Greater than eight. Greater than oh, yeah. two, three times. Yes. That's what I'm thinking. Yes. But it sounds like I'm hearing something. I guess my point is, I'm just kind of confused. If we, even if even if the local governments did not contribute, because there cannot be an expectation that the local government is going to contribute. Is that the expectation? That the local governments would contribute the same on top of the CBTA putting in 25 to $28 million. No, there was okay. not an expectation. That but it sounds like I just, it sounds like I just heard that 
I don't know. I, I feel like I'm hearing that there is a there's still a money issue. And it sounds like reduction by locality is what I heard initially. Uh, Julie, I, I, um, now this is capital here. So this is, there's, we, yeah, this is, so, so we're not dealing with this. We're dealing right. With so this is just a general operating question. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, didn't uh, GCU cut that funding to GRTC and pay? They, there was an allowance that we did go into negotiation with them right. that during COVID, they were allowed to cut their contribution in half as well. And that was also supported through CARES Act money. So it did not cut our actual amount of money available to us because we had the federal amounts to provide for that. Oh. So I think that there, there are some, it, there are a lot of complexities in our budget, especially when it comes to operating capital. This presentation itself is specifically about capital. Transit across the country <coughs> tends to have greater needs than revenues. This board has to amend or adjust or create policies to reflect that. We will only put the service out that we have the money to fund. Truly though, it does seem like the, uh, the you know, maybe again, part of uh, some of us new members getting up to speed, et cetera, but it does seem like the board in its future has some key areas that we are going to need to coalesce around as far as what our, our what our plans are. We've got questions of operator pay from a competitiveness as well as sustainability. We've got uh, what does the expansion of GRGC look like, utilizing CBTA revenues or other you know revenues that come with enhanced ridership and, and, and expansion. Um, that's both a short and medium term program need, given the fact that we have not determined what that. CBTA funding, you know, how it will be utilized. Where does fair fee free fit in that as far as where does it fall as a priority within our regional funding or you know city funding or or other localities because it, it, it is something that, that impacts the entire system. Um, and then we have some of the longer term big expansion goals, whether that be a north south BRT or BRT expansion, et cetera, that we have to um, kind of see where that fits in our prioritization, right? Because we do have more needs than, than funding. That is public sector 101. Um, so it's a prioritization question. And then, um, you know, the, the, the next and last thing is how much are we investing in expansion versus enhancement within existing service, be that in capital like buses and shelters or, um, you know, versus routes. And, and you know, it certainly seems like the, the operator shortage or you know challenge billing offers puts us in maybe some different decisions in the short term because it doesn't seem like a, a significant regional expansion in the short term is viable until we get back on top of um staff right and so i guess what you know it seems like we have a lot of decisions to make yes. but there's funding there with which to make the decisions there is funding there to make the decision that this board this new board will be responsible over the next year or two of developing a long-term strategy for how we manage the growth of the system and the resource allocation for existing service and future service. This is one piece, one lever that's associated with how we manage those operational costs because of the flexing of money between capital and operations. There's nothing here to say that this is um, the, the end of it, there's, nothing, there's no approval process necessary for this presentation. It is an awareness that when we put $9 million of our capital money from feds into ops to support that, that does have an implication and a cost on our capital side. But it's not good or bad, it just is. Okay. Um, okay. Other questions here? Let's go. I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> so that's the capital presentation. The final one was just to make sure that you're aware that when you do see the cap, the operations budget later in this meeting, it will include that nine and a half million dollars. You now understand the downstream consequences of what we're trying to balance with that. It will still be recommended that we put that nine and a half million dollars in the budget and that we have some policy discussions over the course of the year 
with the different levers. Julia, we considered whether using utilizing the, the that delta on CBTA for ops so that you can keep that money in capital. You mean the, the to give rough numbers? I, I know you don't exactly. She's said nine and seven. The, between the twenty one million dollars to the twenty eight million dollars that, that delta. Yeah. So if you if, if the if the, the trade off that you're at least maybe I'm hearing the concern is that when you move the money from capital into operations, you lose some of the matching funds we would get from the federal and state. So it seems like maybe the best use of our CBTA money would be to apply it to operations and keep our capital money in that matching account where that would be available. Is that a potential option for this board to consider? It absolutely is. Okay. There are several different ways that we can push and pull money between operations and capital and where that money lands to preserve it for maximum match. There are some scenarios there. And over the, like I said, over the course of the year, we'll have to look at resource allocation and policies of where we do it. In the past, when I got here two, three years ago, the practice was to rename budget neutral in operations, flex as much of the money you can into operations and then remain budget neutral. I think that in the future, there's going to be some allocation policies of whether or not that is where we want to keep going or whether or not we want to push money into a reserve or push money into a capital reserve or push money into uh, back into the 5307, which comes with the federal strings or push money back into CBTA. We have levers that we can push and it will be a, a larger conversation about what our goals are as a region around mobility and how we allocate those funds. Okay, thank you. Um, so we need to have an executive session here. And how do I do that, Bonnie? Todd is going to uh, well, make Todd gets to read the roll. All right. <laughs> we previously had this assignment. Yeah. I know not to sit next to I move that the board called a closed meeting pursuant to section 2.2 3711, subsection A 29 of the Code of Virginia to discuss the status and terms of the collective bargaining agreement. Class discussion and open session would adversely affect your agency's. Two. All right. I move that we uh, that we do that. Um, so there's second, please. Second. second. Um, moved and seconded that we move into closed session. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Is anyone opposed? We'll go into closed session. Yes. Mr. Chairman, for the members who do want to stay until we're back in open session, uh, we have some seating across the hall that you're welcome to use. Please remember to wear your mask when you're in the operating area.
so that you can serve uh, properly. Is this everyone? Okay, this is the unfinished house. We're out. Okay. <laughs> well, are we here? Okay, so um, we need a resolution or something red, don't we? Well, um, it says we didn't. My, my understanding. As we were preparing for the closed meeting, it became clear that there was a motion needing to be made that had to be made in open session. Therefore, we are in open session now. We will take up that motion and then to make it very clear that nothing will be discussed in a closed meeting, um, it's outside. Contrary to the motion, we will take up the closed meeting motion again. Okay. So, so does that mean that that motion is, it's already been let's get it again. seconded? Don't we need to come no, we agree that we're redoing it? Or we're we, yeah. we yes. Redo, okay. yeah. so, but we don't need to read this thing that says we certify we didn't discuss. Or do we? Well, because the discussion that you are about to have in open session is exactly the discussion we determined should not be okay, in see. closed so meeting. So, in order to comply right. with, okay, would you open make the motion meetings? again, um, yes. please, um, Mr. Chairman? As we enter closed session, um, it is the it, it's my desire as a representative of the city of Richmond that. Um, our director of um, equitable trains and mobility, um, Mr. Roman Moffar, be able to um, sit in the closed session to hear the discussion and be able to advise um, myself and the city um, as to what our appropriate roles are, our actions are as a board. Are you moving to this also include um, staff I, people from the other jurisdictions? I would move that that be um, approved for um, Enrico and Chesterville if they have a representative present. All right, so, so we, second, we second it because we would love our chief of staff, Courage Retainer, to be in this meeting as well. Right. It's been moved and seconded that um, in the closed session um, that is about to be held again, that um, a chosen representative of each of the three jurisdictions, if wished, um, who's a staff person, be allowed to be present. Um, any further discussion on this? I'll just mention that I'm, given the topic of the closed session, I, I disagree with uh, with that and not put it forth. Not to preclude it from other future sessions, just based on the topic of today's session. Okay, other other things. Anybody want to say anything else? Just so it's on the record, since it's my first meeting, can we clarify what the policy has been in the past of this board? Um, it's not in my two and a half years being here, so I can't speak before that. The chair and vice chair and the other members will. Uh, the people who have been in a closed session have been only, to my knowledge, GRTC staff and GRTC board members. There have been no other members from the jurisdictions in those meetings in the past. That has been the practice. Um. Thank you. Um, and uh, Lincoln, my understanding of your motion um, is that it uh, it, it uh, deals with this meeting in particular. Uh, not as, as we're not dealing with the question of permanent policy at this point in time. Given the fact that in our first meeting today there is a closed session on the agenda, I made the motion for this closed for session. This closed session if you. it is is or is if it is, or perhaps it either way. If it's not the will of the board to to do that today. I would strongly ask that we uh, review our policy and provide clear guidelines as to when and when. Uh, again, I've, I've participated in a lot of public meetings, and it is my understanding and, and, and experience that um, if the, a body going into closed session feels that outside expertise is either needed or helpful, we have, as a board, have the um, option of, of requesting that, that staff or otherwise participate, be it outside consultant staff or, or otherwise. So. Um, but this particular resolution of uh, motion is for this today's meeting. So let me, it, it's, yes, this motion is for regards to today's meeting, but I will say I don't have necessarily full clarity on the topic of our closed session to know everything about why, which is why I would prefer, you know, the, the city staffer who works day in and day out on transit issues 
have the benefit of, of this information um, and to advise me. If I might clarify my prior response, I would ask staff to confirm, but I believe that when there have been specific GRTC consultants on a certain issue that's relevant to a closed session, such as healthcare negotiations, that that expertise has been allowed. Yes. So I'm sorry, I, let me clarify that. So again, from the city's perspective, this is our general transit expertise, um, the person hired to support, advise, and, and has participated in these meetings consistently for the last several years. Um, that's my request. Uh, do we have specific language on the nature of this closed session, or is it just generic? Generic? The motion that's being made? The motion that was made earlier to go into closed session. Yes. Did, um, did the it give a specific session, topic? Yes, the closed session will involve the status in terms of a collective bargaining agreement because discussion in an open session would adversely affect GRTC's bargaining position. Thank you. Danny, what's, what's your, you've been here since 1979. Um, what's, what's your history? It's just a, a new dilemma that we've had. Okay. I don't think we've ever had. Could anybody invited to closed sessions have typically been essential to the presentation? Yeah, okay. the presentation. I think Lincoln's on um, point. You know, I mean, the CBTA is it, a totally different um, operation, so we can have stay up in closed session with CBTA. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that doesn't mean we want the future. Yeah, this, yeah, this one is hitting us in a different way. This is our, um, again, this, this is my first time being in a GRTC meeting. I understand that there's a culture prior to us being here, but we're here now. So, this is, um, you know, I, I stand by my second. Let's just vote. And if you guys voted down, you any further down. conversation? All right, Joe, um, are you going to do the uh, roll call vote here? Uh, so it's been moved and seconded that the closed session that has been described by Todd, um, uh, at, at that session, each of the jurisdictions be allowed to include one of their staff people who they feel is, is uh, essential for, uh, for knowing what's going on in transportation. Um, that sounds okay, as stated. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ready to roll? Yeah. Chair Campbell? No. Vice Chair Armstrong? No. Mr. Coles? Aye. Yes. Mr. Saunders? Aye. Mr. Engel? No. Mr. Smith? No. Mr. Yuri? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Aye. Fail. Motion fails um, because the majority of Chesterfield delegation voted against it. Um, all right, so now we um, need to move to go back into closed session. Yes. Well, Riri, uh, I move that the board hold a closed meeting pursuant to section 2.2 3711, section A29 of the Code of Virginia to discuss the status in terms of a collective bargaining agreement. Class discussion and open session will adversely affect your perceived bargaining position. All right, I move uh, second, please. Second. Uh, I move and seconded that we go into closed session to deal with this issue of collective bargaining agreement. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Anyone opposed? All right, it's passed.
Okay, Tom, would you make a motion, please? All right, so where is the board of directors of DOTC has convened and closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote in accordance with provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, where section 2.2 3712 of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be resolved that the board hereby certifies. That to the best of each member's knowledge, and only public matters lawfully exempt from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certifying resolution applies, and two, only such public business as matters identified in the motion to meeting the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. All right. So, um, so Janice, you doing this? Uh, yeah. or Joe, are you doing this? Yeah. Call names. <laughs> issue of this board and because we have had such a lengthy conversation, my recommendation uh, would be for the board to consider deferring the next action item to the May board, and that is the FY22 <coughs> budget and capital plan. Should you wish to have discussion, um, after that might be relevant, but again, if you wish to defer it until May, that we would bring it back to you at that time. So I would like to, we're going to try to defer the operational budget. Um, Capital plan until May meeting. Does anybody have any objection to that? Do you need a motion? Or was that your motion? Did you, you make a motion? motion? I don't think we need a motion. Um, I say we, we got to do that. Yes, I mean, can I make a comment regarding that? Yeah, just please. Further context, but it seems like we have questions regarding state funding levels. Sounds like there's probably six million in potential incremental funding for the state, but you won't know until the state finalizes their budget. Um, clearly, we had a lot of robust discussions today, and there's you know some of us who are new members who are, are obviously currently getting up to speed. Um, but it seems like again, we've got a lot of questions about funds that are available and what our priorities are within those funding um, it, to all the things that we've discussed today. I think the additional time and particularly additional clarity from the state is critical for us being able to make an informed decision on the budget. So I support the CEO's motion to. Um, Hold off finalization until we get that clarity. Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, if the state doesn't pass yeah. that until June 30th, is that going to put us in a position yeah. where we can't function? I might be. Um, it will. I would come back in May and I would recommend that we adopt it based on a more robust discussion. And I will make sure that the um, at the pleasure board that the May agenda is less robust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah. You know, we really, um, the city really cares about um, the business of financing our first year of zero fare and trial. Uh, that's really important to us. So that needs to be part of my conversation. Um, I've got a recommendation, but I hold it to other business. It's related to the budget. Yeah. So we're going to hold that till this meeting, Tyrone, or later? No, I'm going to do it. He's going to do it in other business. Just other business. Term. Okay. So, uh, with is there anybody who disagrees with uh, putting the budget off until next meeting? All right. Uh, so, Julie, what else you got? Uh, the last thing is a motion, uh, an action item to adopt the regional public transportation plan. This is uh, just a very quick briefing on this. It was uh, this is something we talked about this early in the board meeting that the public transportation plan has in it under the page 100 of the board book. A recommendation that we continue to maintain existing service, not grow in FY23, and that we use the CBTA funds consistent with what we did in FY22 and the amounts of $21 million to support existing operations and then up to $600,000 to support uh, implementation of the FY24 regional public transportation plan, leverage capital funds, microtransit, and that we send this. Uh, document to the CBTA for their approval at their April 29th CBTA board meeting. You can send it without your approval and you can approve it later, but if you do not, I do not recommend that. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, can I have a motion for this? Um, this is a pretty uh, pro forma kind of thing for us to do, um, which is to approve to approve this plan and send it to the. And this plan is essentially based in current service levels as opposed to uh, regional expansion. It does not have any expansion in it. Correct. So, so essentially, we're submitting to sorry, we're submitting to CBTA a proposal for CBTA funding that maintains current. Is that 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 essentially replicates what's already in our service plan? Right? With the understanding that if we are able to accelerate hiring, we would go back with an expansion plan afterwards for that that staffing. Again, so we we have we have not decisioned on expansion. Correct. We are submitting to CBTA our current operations for the, the CBTA transit funding. And um, so we're not you know, bypassing our future conversations about. Yeah. I don't think we're blocking it. Tom, like, you were part of producing this too. I, I was in for clarification on Julie's point. So if we find the situation for hiring drivers and, and funding appears to be available, we would have the option of going back to CBK and amending this about this plan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I don't think there's much risk in, in I, adopting this. Yeah, could I have a motion for this? So we adopt this. Um, second? Second. Um, is there anyone in opposition to this? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, that's great. Uh, so this is passed. Oh, yeah. You're right here. Right. Thanks. Uh, did you have something? Uh, uh, yeah, oh, so your business uh, would be after they are the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I will make this brief, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm skipping over most of what I'm saying just to remind the board that in the May board meeting, it will be moved by a week because many members will be at the intercity chamber visit. So the May meeting will be on May the 24th here at this building at 8 a.m. All right, thank you. Everything else? Uh, just, uh, everything else can wait. Thanks. All right. Um, I'd like a vote by acclamation that uh, this board extends its gratitude to George Braxton and Ian Milliken for their faithful and careful service on the board. Can I have uh, all in favor of that? Please say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, would you please see that this is notified to yes, these two fine gentlemen who I, I'll miss? Um, the, um, at the University of Richmond on Wednesday the 20th. When is that? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> three three o'clock in the Cousins Center. Um, there is a, a program that U of R students have been preparing and working with bus operators here at GRTC for some time. And it's really it's a their work has been really good because the sense of the culture and the strength of, of our operator uh, community is really important to the effectiveness of this company. And uh, so if you'd like to be a, to see what they're doing, it's at three o'clock. Uh, it's uh, be about an hour at the Cousins Theater of the Modlin Center, and uh, they all want you there. Um, the, um, that's all I got, so to say, uh, I think this is just a really important moment for us as a community. Um, you know, in a sense, it's the, it's the first big hit into uh, regional sharing of a large amount of money. And um, and it's important because it's going to grow us as a community. Uh, there are a few, few elbows thrown, um, but that's the growth. I like basketball. I like throwing elbows. <laughs> and um, so uh, we'll get there. And I, I, I'm grateful for everybody being here. And I do think we're going to do something important uh, for this region uh, by doing this together over this next period of time. Uh, two recommendations. Uh, one that may be made uh, to be considered in the May meeting. I think that this board is now big enough to break down into some committee work. I, the, and the reason that I, I make this suggestion is this the board is just so much stuff. And, um, and I, I understand the one-on-one -on -one meetings or two-on whatever previously and everybody hearing, um, but I think if we can break break to some, you know, break into committees, 
uh, there's three on each one. I don't know how many committees. Maybe we can talk about it. And they, uh, it will help us um, when it comes to having our general meeting. You know, a four-hour meeting is, yeah. is, is just not, I mean, you lose people after a while. So uh, I make the, if, you know, if we can put that on the agenda to discuss, maybe we can start, Mr. Chair, if you want to, start thinking about what committees, who you want to be on the committees, et cetera. And also, my second recommendation is um, maybe we need to have a, a budget work session or something prior to. Um, because if not, then the main I'm meeting seeing good to, nods around yeah, here, so let's then, do that. The, the main yeah. meeting need to be, needs to be the budget meeting if you're not going to do a work right. session. Because it's this is our first meeting with an additional jurisdiction and um, new people. And I think we really need more time. We just kind of, we need, we need to go back and talk to our own folk and then, because we're representing our own yeah. So, yeah, I guess jump back. I, I really like that suggestion. I, mean, I think committee's is strong and, you know, with our, our current structure, you know, having a representative of locality and committee committees would, would work very well for making sure you felt like, you know, there's three, you should give people who understand that the operations really, that the operations people really that on the budget, I've been on the budget, and it might help with some of the information uh, management. Um, but I also really like the work session and encourage us to do it sooner than later. And we'll get the different scenarios we have in front of us. I mean, um, literally, you know, if, if, if this, I believe, was briefly discussed in the closed session, but um, the budget document represent, you know, has 8 million as the city's contribution. The city's contribution is actually closer to 8.7. It goes into our conversation about how um, the city's contribution of 8.7 applies to, you know, having a million of that apply to fare free and, and that being the city's kind of more formal request of this board. Um, and then beyond that, we have questions about other, other funding streams. It is, it, 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 it will be a challenge if we're decisioning in the same meeting we're having those same questions. And so I'd love to suggest that a first budget work session be scheduled sooner than later so that we can get greater clarity and if more are needed before we get to May, we can do that. And, okay, if you know, we'll do that. Um, and, let me just say that we're looking at a big decision as we move forward, which is how we deal with local jurisdictional contributions vis-a-vis -vis CBTA money. And uh, since we just grandfathered the contributions of NRICO and everybody's contribution at 50% plus CPI, uh, as a way of moving forward, we've got to do this. We have to really look at kind of what is the local contribution, what is the CBTA contribution, and how does that fit into a larger, because it, right. it feels like we're trying to do too much to parse this line of revenue to this, et cetera, et cetera. I understand there's some federal restrictions we have to work with, but the question is, what are our priorities? Can we fund them within our within our budget? And then what ancillary additional investments can we make to create the revenues for savings in the current fiscal year are available to us. And, and I'm looking forward to those conversations. I think there's a lot of opportunity in front of us. Can we, um, uh, Mr. Chair, can we, uh, is it okay in the budget discussion that we bring applicable staff during that meeting and also during the committee meetings as we bring that to the committee? I think that's something that we need to think about. So, um, so uh, we'll come up with a specific proposal quickly on on both the committee thing and um, and the work session. Um, I, I, think, uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate the very um, considered responses from the board. I understand that this is a big decision for uh, we have five new board members. The budget was presented to the January board, and now our board is significantly different. So bringing you up to speed at the, the height of budget season is going to be a challenge. I appreciate your comments to have a work session. I think it would be very useful, and I would be pleased to put that together as soon as possible based on events calendars. Is there is it impossible for people to see the proposed budget? It's actually in, home? it's in the board book in your packet. Okay. If there is a presentation that has it at a high level, that yes, you can see the. Uh, I, I think we have Can I get this board packet electronically? Yes, you can. Because I would rather be able to blow it up and look at some of the I looked through my emails and I saw the comments and I saw this. This, but I didn't see it. I'll send it again. All right, is there any further business to the board? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
If not, I hope you all have a blessed rest of the day.